for the next four agenda items. Uh, members aware of any other apologies? I think Daniel is trying, endeavouring to join us. Um, he may be having some internet problems. Okay, no problem. Uh, uh, no chairperson's business um, for today. Draft minutes. Can I refer members to draft minutes of the committee meeting of the 9th of September 2020 at page 50 of their meeting packs and seek members' agreements that the minutes are a complete and accurate record of proceedings. Agreed? Agreed. Agreed. Thank you. Okay. No matters arising, members? Okay. Can I ask Assembly Broadcasting to remove all members who are not in room 29 from the spotlight? and add the SIA witnesses uh, to the uh, session. I think we're a wee bit ahead of ourselves. Uh, okay. So the SIA are just outside and uh, I think Margaret may join us later. Okay. Just waiting for SIA witnesses to be they're, brought they're in. Yeah, no problem. Okay, members, as our uh, SIA witnesses are, are joining us then, agenda item five is our oral briefing from SIA on curriculum and assessment 2021. Representatives from the Council for Curriculum Examination and Assessment will brief the committee on feedback from the consultation on proposed changes to GCSE, AS and A-level curricula and assessment in 2020-21. Can I refer members to your packs, which include a cover note from the clerk at page 61, the SIA consultation document at page 69, related papers from teaching unions at page 152, correspondence from a concerned parent at page 199, which appears to show the number of NI entries with the Welch examining board at A level, and also refer members to correspondence from SIA at table papers. A paper summarising responses has not been provided. Uh, when SIA briefed the committee on the 3rd of June 2020 on grading consultation, they did provide a short paper summarising responses. Can I welcome then Mr Justin Edwards, the Chief Executive of the Council for the Curriculum Examination and Assessment in person. Very welcome, Justin. Uh, Mr Trevor Carson. Chairman, Chairperson of the Council for the Curriculum Examinations and Assessment uh, in person as well. Very welcome, Trevor. And we're hoping to add Miss Margaret Farragher, Director of Education at SIA by Starleaf. Is that in place, yet. Clark? Okay. Do you want to see if Justin wants to start? Okay. Well, by, while we're waiting for Margaret, and, and by way of further welcome, um, the committee wrote to SIA asking if at this briefing you would be able to clarify a number of issues, including the absence of pre-consultation on changes to the curriculum uh, with the teaching unions, the absence of a timescale for a consultation on the curriculum for vocational qualifications, the need for clarity on the timing of examinations in summer 2021, and uh, uncertainty as to whether the changes to the curriculum will ensure that there is no disadvantage to non-selective schools. Can I uh, invite the witnesses then to uh, brief us and respond to those particular issues? Um, you'll have 10 to 15 minutes to make an opening sta statement and then we'll take um, answer questions from members. That sound okay? Yeah. Okay, thanks very much. Uh, thanks. Good morning. Uh, thanks for the opportunity to update you on the proposals for examinations and assessment for 2021 series and the steps that SIA have taken in that regard. I think it's important to note the highly unusual circumstances we all find ourselves in, the dynamic of the situation where actions and decisions taken across other jurisdictions do inevitably have varying degrees of impact to what SIA are required to do in this jurisdiction. As Chair, I do liaise with my counterparts in SQA, Qualification Wales and Ofqual. As Chair of SIA Council and my colleagues see our role as holding Justin and his team to account to ensure that Council is kept well informed uh, of courses of action and the risks associated with them. However, my colleagues and I have as our focus the interests of the pupils in the three strands of SIA responsibility, assessment, regulation and curriculum, and to ensure that fairness underpins SIA activity. It's right and proper that SIA work is scrutinised by 
the Assembly Education Committee, the departments and the Minister, as well as the range of stakeholders in the education landscape. It is important also that I once again publicly acknowledge the incredible effort put in by Justin and his senior team, all of the CS staff in these incredibly difficult circumstances, all doing their absolute level best to deliver outcomes that are as fair as possible to all candidates. It is easy to underestimate the toll it takes on staff working flat out in the eye of the storm and sustained criticism, and I know that that comes with the job, but it is still difficult for staff, especially with the current, current working arrangements. Finally, I would like to highlight that Council obviously take our governance uh, role uh, very seriously, and we have done throughout this episode from March on, and we have scrutinised in detail the work of SEA. It is demanding and difficult to accommodate all points of view and to meet the remit that SEA has under legislation. But I do believe that SEA is a listening organisation. It seeks to improve constantly, and our IIP progress, I believe, reflects this. I, along with the Permanent Secretary for the Department, hold the CEO, Justin Edward, to account, and I believe that SEA are fortunate with the skills, strategic understanding, and sustained energy and leadership that Justin brings to this job. Thank you. Um, thank you to the committee for the opportunity to come and present today. Um, I would like to um, take the opportunity with the committee to discuss the 2020-2021 uh, proposals and in structure um, will inform the committee of how those proposals were reached. Um, the broad basis for those proposals within inside the uh, consultation document and include some of the, the high level feedback that we've received and then the next steps and through that then in the next steps also address the other non-general qualifications simultaneously as well. Um, at the commencement, SEA was asked for advice from the Department for Education regarding the operations of examinations in 2020-2021. I think that um, in regards to that advice, it was a different um, process in comparison to, say, for example, the appeals process where we consulted on the appeals process for summer 2020. In the appeals process, SEA was um, directed or asked to um, implement an appeals process and alternative, and that remained very much within inside our space, whereas advice to the Department of Education must go through council um, through to the minister. And I'll explain where we are in terms of the timeline on that shortly. We commenced that work, and during uh, June 2020, while also working on the alternative examinations arrangements for summer 2020, um, we engaged with a broad spectrum of practitioners. Um, we chose to engage on the basis of subjects, because the qualifications are divided into subject areas, and therefore um, actually listening to teachers, practitioners, industry experts, higher education providers, and a cross-section um, from schools uh, was very important in reaching that advice. And during that period, we engaged with approximately 300 people. Um, and we engaged through subject advisory groups, but we also engaged with um, a cross-section of principals fora or, or principals groups. And we also engaged <coughs> with um, a number of the unions uh, through that in terms of understanding where we were in that advice. Following uh, that, um, we did understand that there were some particular challenges and it became very evident to us that there were two key themes um, that we had to consider in any amendments or any arrangements that we were going to propose. And the two themes were adjustments that were considered or may be required in regards to health and health restrictions. And that was very challenging for SEER as a body because we were trying to project forward into next summer. Um, where we might be um, in terms of health restrictions in the pandemic. We wanted to provide as much stability as we possibly could so learners had an understanding of, of where that would be uh, by next summer. And so building, building in um, advice on that was going to be challenging. And the second thing that we had to consider was there was early indication even at that point around the impact on teaching and learning, um, particularly with the closure from the 20th of March 
of schools and disruption to teaching and learning and how we might um, address that particular issue through the burden of assessment. We had to balance those two factors together with also having a, a valid uh, assessment instrument and an assessment instrument that could carry forward GCSE and A-level uh, grades and qualifications with confidence for those learners as well and, and, a, and a very difficult balancing act that was. And so we listened to the subject advisory groups about changes that we might be able to make um, in regards to public health adaptations but also in terms of um, easing burden. I think it would be fair to say that through those discussions there were some subjects where there was quite quickly uniform agreement um, and quite quickly some good suggestions that people could commit to. And in other subject areas, there was disagreement um, and disagreement about the approach that might be taken and it was a broad spectrum of approaches. We outlined um, on the 17th of July then um, to the department these kind of key um, issues, uh, one about impact and, um, and burden on learning and the other about the challenges of looking forward into what health restrictions might apply over a much longer period of time and how that could be balanced through the assessment. And we were able to build, um, at that point, a model and approach on key principles that we were able to take forward to council um, for an approved general approach. What we didn't want to do here was have um, individual subject approaches on their own. We also wanted a, a consolidated general approach so that particularly learners and their parents could understand the, the, the um, approach that we were taking. We presented those proposals to the Council on the 21st of July and then that required us beyond that to test um, the qualification of cha changes to make sure that they were still compatible with the general principles of the GCSE and A-level qualification and we submitted that in proposal to the Department on the 30th of July. On the 10th of August, the Department accepted the Council's proposal for the general approach that we were to take, and the 10th of August was the Monday prior to the A-level issue of results. We had opportunity at that point to obviously issue the consultation, but given the matters around both A-level and GCSE results in those two weeks, we felt that it would better to delay, understand the issues from the A-level and GCSE and reflect that in anything that we were going to consult on. We therefore launched post the GCSE results on the 24th of August and provided a two-week consultation. Now the consultation, as the department had asked us to do from the 10th of August, was a consultation on arrangements should examinations operate, but we have also been considering in parallel to that um, contingencies should examinations not be able to operate. There were over 7,000 responses to the consultation by the close of play on Monday the 7th of, uh, of September. A substantial response to our consultation is probably one of the highest responses we've ever received. And in terms of that then, um, SIA has spent then the last week um, analysing those 7,000 responses and coming up with um, high level proposals or considerations for Council. Council met yesterday to consider those proposals and the Chairman has asked me to draft then the final advice to the Department. Um, it is um, in discussions with the Department, um, I, out of courtesy, a, a matter that the Department and officials and the Minister receives that advice first, in, including the research reports um, which we will make available um, after that for the Minister then to have opportunity to consider um, that advice uh, from SEER Council. Having said that, I, I take the opportunity to talk to the committee today about those broad um, proposals, the rationale and thinking behind them, um, and as I said, some of the high-level feedback. I don't want to dwell on every page of what is a complex document. We recognise there are complexities um, in terms of the delivery of the examinations, but certainly um, from the, the head of the document, as you said, um, we wish to aim to run a full examination series. We know that there may be challenges um, in regards to that, but that was one of the aims. We did have to seek um, feedback on um, proposals to original decisions in regards to Year 11 candidates um, and AS uh, candidates. Um, we were aware uh, that 
Obviously, in the summer 2020 proposals on AS candidates, we had proposed that the A2 examination would form part of the outcome, and then we would retrospectively calculate the, the AS result, contributing towards an overall UMS, because the AS grade coming out of summer 2020 doesn't have a, a UMS. And we recognise that in the public context and the, and the learning from summer 2020, the idea of a, a calculated grade um, is, is not an approach that we should take, so we had to remove that in terms of our proposals. Um, we, as I said, are considering the broader contingencies, but the consultation was limited to how we adapt examinations, um, should they be able to run, and it's our intent to run those. And also, um, we did consider whether we should reduce actual specifications or make uh, amendments to assessment instruments. The challenge with um, reducing specifications is that you could um, remove content that learners wish to learn and work towards. Um, and so always our proposals were to look at assessment instrument adaptations. And by adjusting assessment instrument adaptations, it would provide opportunity for learners um, to have reduced burden, coming back to that second key issue we identified in the pre-consultation, to reduce burden, to allow more space for teaching and learning and catch up while still holding the specification hold. We also um, sought feedback, um, as you're aware, in the, in the proposals around defined order of teaching and assessment, um, both at GCSE, AS, uh, and A2, across the range of the years to facilitate contingencies, but also to give um, teachers and learners more certainty in the pathway towards examinations. And we also proposed um, with inside the consultation action that we already uh, were going to take in regards to portfolios, so carrying forward controlled assessment work that would support learners across the years, and then adaptations on um, practical assessments with inside that proposals. In the, in the public health adaptations, I think the broad feedback that we've received is that certainly SEER should and must make public health adaptations, and you will see from the appendices um, changes that we have made. In specification order, um, we did receive high-level feedback and, and broad feedback that, while it's useful to some degree, teachers and schools also appreciate the availability of choice and options through their pathway and, and to own the teaching order in terms of professional conduct. So specification teaching order, whilst recognised as, as value, also we received uh, information through groups that we should allow also that flexibility um, to exist. With the cancellation of the idea of calculated grades for the AS retrospective on A2, we proposed in the consultation just to proceed with the basis of the A2 examination. So a learner working towards a full A-level outcome would take the A-level the A-level examinations and then they would receive an overall grade on the basis of that. But we did say that we would run the AS examinations should they feel that they still wanted to do that. And then changes to assessment at GCSE, you'll see in the proposals, are much more broader and deeper. Our approach to this was to admit or, or allow schools to omit or discount units in assessment. The full specification still remains in place, but actually omission of a unit allows school to find space in terms of each qualification area. Whilst that was a general principle of approach, there were challenges in implementing that general principle of approach. And these were to do with maintaining the, the validity of the qualification. One of the issues that we had was choosing units in a way that didn't undermine all the assessment objectives. Um, so in some subjects, removing some units might have had a counter issue in terms of assessment objectives. The second issue was that if we were to remove some units, we would fall below 50% of the overall assessment burden. And we felt at that point that would create um, considerable issues. Another challenge that arose on GCSEs was that we have um, modularity in GCSE and the order of assessment and the order of teaching varies between schools. So finding um, an approach that fitted all schools and all historic approaches was very, very challenging. And so we chose to specify the unit that would be allowed for a mission so that we had consistency across the teaching um, provision. 
In some, in some cases, that was accepted by subject groups, and in other cases, that was a challenge for subject groups because, by the very nature of the modularity, they may have taught or covered some of the content already. I think that, overall, uh, at high-level feedback, there's broad agreement for the reduction that doesn't exceed 40 per cent. I think that, overall, um, there isn't the level of agreement around the ideas of optionality with inside question papers, and particularly we've heard feedback for those children with special educational needs that it could lose to, lead to confusion and affect learners in, in um, lower grade or attainment outcomes. We've also heard um, back that um, there are views around our proposals on English and mathematics at GCSE. And one of the challenges on English and mathematics at GCSE was that we felt it was a key qualification, a key qualification for progression to employment and further learning. And therefore, we had proposed that it wasn't, it was two subjects where we would not allow admission. Um, and we would ask schools to work towards the full, um, the full assessment portfolio for those two qualifications. But there are divided views on that. There are divided views on whether they should be maintained the full assessment burden. Um, and then there are others who do see the rationale in terms of maintaining it as a key qualification for learning progression. And on that basis, um, we have taken the feedback. And as I said yesterday, we did consider some of these high level factors um, with the committee, along with the appendices, which has the adjustments at individual subject level, which the committee we, may want to discuss. Just on um, the other matter of vocational qualifications, I think that it would be worth defining to the committee that there, there are effectively three groups of qualifications. There are general qualifications, which these proposals deal with, GCSEs and A-levels and AS qualifications. There are vocational qualifications, and the policy for vocational qualifications remains the domain of the Department for the, for the Economy. Um, and the Department for Education and the Department for Economy work on those qualifications together. And then there are what we would refer to as other general qualifications, and included with that are entry-level qualifications and occupational studies. We have been engaged with the department um, on our proposals for occupational studies and entry-level qualifications, and um, through this week have been engaged in that. And we have sought clarity because we wish to proceed with the consultation on that at a matter of urgency and pace. Um, I think our preference would be to have moved forward with the occupational studies and entry-level qualifications in correspondence with the GCSEs, but there are significant um, challenges with occupational studies because there's a lot of practical work and practical <coughs> elements assessments um, within inside that qualification. So on that basis, um, we, uh, we were in discussion and I believe that we can proceed with the consultation on that and conclude that consultation quickly so that we can come up with arrangements for those two types of qualifications as well. If the committee wishes me to discuss about vocational qualifications which are outside that scope, I'll happily answer any questions that you may have on that basis. And with that outline, Chairman, and I know it's a detailed outline, I'll, I'll hand over to the committee then to answer questions and explore those proposals. Okay, yeah, we've pro a fair bit to get through, so I'll, I'll try and proceed as expeditiously as possible. Um, and if you could make your answers as concise as possible as, as well then, um, witnesses. Um, can, I, can I ask very briefly any key lessons learned from examinations 2020? That, that you can apply to 2021? I think that um, the, the point I made in the opening statement, Chair, was we recognise that calculated grades using statistical standardisation um, is not an approach that we should in any way introduce in the 2020-2021 proposals, and we have removed all that um, from these proposals. In removing that, we did have to revisit some of the proposals um, that we had made to those pre-consultation groups uh, in order to make uh, amendments and adaptations. I think that um, we also recognise that there is a balance between um, the, the standard of where we wish to retain those qualifications and standards that might apply in regards to pandemic. I think we have to recognise coming out of uh, the 20th of March closure that schools are asking for reduced burden so that they can spend time with learners catching up, addressing knowledge, skills and understanding. Uh, and we have to recognise that. 
uh, and we've recognised that through, as I said, a broad approach. And our approaches to reduction and assessment burden, particularly at GCSE, go further and deeper than, than uh, changes proposed in, in England. So whilst we are um, later than those proposals in England, maybe it takes opportunity to reflect on the lessons from, from the summer and bring forward proposals that are more broader and more sweeping in recognition of that fact. Okay, and, and is there any type of review being undertaken of 2020 um, with a view to inform contingency planning for 2021? Obviously, staff will be off, pupils will be off. There will be positive cases of COVID, symptomatic cases of COVID that will see <laughs> up to 14-day absences. Um, are there any contingency plans in place should there need to be any level of um, centre-assessed grading as to what um, moderation or standardisation would look like for 2021? And I presume you can give a guarantee that the flawed aspects of standardisation 2020 will not form part of that approach? In uh, consideration, and this is early consideration of contingency measures, I think we also need to take from the summer some of the positives learned um, in regards to schools and their operational environments and providing data. We did have good data capture and good data return from schools, which we can benefit from in a contingency arrangement. But I do accept, as you say, Chair, that the use of statistical standardisation won't feature um, in our approach in regards to contingency measures. If I, if I could just add, at yesterday's council meeting, once we had got through the business about what the assessment arrangements for 2021 should be. We asked uh, Justin and his team to come forward with uh, updated proposals for contingency arrangements uh, for our next council meeting, which is actually next week, uh, because I think if there's a lesson that council learned, it was that uh, in a, a rather unpredictable environment, uh, the speed of response is important, and I think uh, it would have been difficult to come up with a contingency plan any quicker uh, in May and June of this year, uh, but we certainly don't want to be caught out like that next okay. year. And would that contingency planning consider different scenarios, such as the lockdown, partial shutdowns, pupil, staff absences? I think, uh, uh, through the Chair, um we have to consider um, broad ranges from uh, longer term lockdowns at individual centres to um, area based lockdowns. But actually, our, our, our focus as well at, at the top end is a full lockdown. Um, and how do we achieve assessment um, with outcomes in a full lockdown without using statistical standardisation uh, okay. in that approach? And as I said, um, there are, there are strengths that should be used, but also areas where, where we, we shouldn't re-explore those. Okay. Obviously the hope is that there will be um, access to examination and assessment. Um, and on that note, would uh, moderation be against 2020 grading or 2019 grading? Um, because the, the brand is shared across the three jurisdictions, both the A-level and the GCSE brands, we will have to engage with colleagues in England and Wales on, on that factor. Um, it, it, it's important that we do consider alignment, not least because there are learners in Northern Ireland who take non-CA examinations at A-level and GCSE, and we would not want to cause advantage or disadvantage to that cohort by making just adjustments to CA. In terms of baseline data, um, we would look at um, baseline data um, which reflects um, examinations situations as opposed to contingency situations um, and the operations of examinations. And we do accept that, um, and we discussed this with Council yesterday, uh, we do accept that there has to be a degree of leniency um, built into any approach of baseline data um, because we have to go back to understanding um, the pressure and, and challenges that young people face. Okay, I'm not going to dwell too much on whether I think I've got an answer to your question or not, given the, the amount of questions that we'll have to get through. Um, can I ask sincerely, why has no written analysis of the consultation responses, which is a convention normally afforded to relevant committees, 
um, been provided uh, to this committee in advance of today, the absence of which makes our response to you extremely difficult. I appreciate that, um, Chairman. It, uh, hopefully, in the timeline that I outlined in my opening presentation, you understood that uh, hopefully it was, it, um, I, I was able to communicate that we are um, running on a, on a particular timeline. Obviously, the consultation closed on Monday. Council only had a chance yesterday to consider that. Um, I would provide both the full response to the consultation and the advice to the minister. And then, once the uh, minister had had opportunity to consider that, release that information, um, releasing all that information in advance of the minister having sight of it, um, I believe would, would go against the convention and courtesy to the department, and, uh, to the minister and his officials. Um, but I, again, um, committed to coming here today to talk about the high-level feedback which we're aware. I, I don't want to dwell on this, but. In the, in the last um, consultation on the appeals process for 2020, you provided the committee with a very helpful written analysis of your consultation on, on that matter, um, setting out why um, particular policies were going to be followed, why others were not. Um, that allowed us to see the, the, the breadth of response that you have received. As you've said yourself, you've received 7,000 responses. Um, it would be very helpful for the committee to, to see uh, the different positions that they have adopted. Um, I, I presume that you provided that written analysis to us last time in advance of the Minister um, receiving guidance or making a final decision, so I'm, I'm at somewhat of a, a loss to understand why that approach hasn't been taken on this occasion on, on equally as important an issue. Can you give us a time scale for when you would be able to provide us with a written analysis of those 7,000 responses and um, the direction of travel you are going to recommend on those different issues? Um, when, once I've presented, um, I, at the moment I have to seek permission from the, the chairman. I uh, drafted up from the council meeting yesterday um, to issue to the department officials and, and for the minister to consider. Uh, once the minister has had opportunity to consider and, and returns, then I'll be in a position to release that information. I would, um, I would differentiate. The, the, in the appeals consultation, it was very much within inside the domain of SIA. Um, the minister had asked SIA to develop the appeals process itself. Um, we, we hadn't gone to seek um, direction on that. We had to develop the appeals process in response to the direction that we had received in regards to examination. And so once we had concluded the, the consultation on that, I was able to bring that forward to the committee immediately, and, and hence why I, I provided all that information at that time. Okay, so you're, um, you're kind of saying it's for the Department of Education to permit you to provide us with a written analysis of the consultation then? I think, I think it's... Um, I, I would just seek that the, the minister has had opportunity to consider those okay. factors. And, and, and we, we would consider protocol for the minister to have first sight of it, but the instruction from <coughs> council to Justin yesterday with the information that will go forward is that it should be treated uh, with absolute urgency. Uh, we would hope that uh, the minister uh, would be in a position to give us a decision uh, by the weekend. Okay. Uh, and Okay, and then the committee can be provided with a written analysis of that consultation. I mean, you, you accept Absolutely. we're extremely hamstrung today, Trevor, in terms of offering you a response uh, when, uh, when normal practice is for us to have a written analysis of that consultation? I uh, appreciate that. Uh, and we had planned to have a council meeting last Friday, which would have put incredible pressure on the team to have the analysis done, and uh, we're in a position to stand over it. Uh, but I have two members of council who are off ill, and calling the meeting at short notice for Friday meant that, although we would have been quarried, uh, I wasn't content that uh, only five or six members of council present making decisions like this was appropriate. So Tuesday was the earliest day that I could get council together, and then once that advice goes to the minister, really we want the decision as soon as possible, and at that point, more than... I mean, it's absolutely okay. essential that the okay. committee I, I, get that. The committee will do its best to offer a, a degree of yeah. response further to today, but can I check in principle schedules permitting that you could perhaps return to the committee next week with a, a, an oral briefing on a, a, a written analysis of the consultation received in advance? Through the, through the chair, I, um, 
I'm, I'm in a position where I <coughs> must provide the information to the minister and once he's had okay. a chance to consider it, um, and, or the department a chance to consider it, if they return to me I, and, and feel... Okay, well, maybe we'll seek some clarity from the department then. We have a wide range of substantive questions to get through, so I'll bring in Deputy Chairperson Karen Mullen. Karen stepped out. It's Karen, oh, Karen's uh, stepped out momentarily. I'll bring her back in when she's able to return. Uh, Robin Newton. Uh, thank you, Chair, and uh, welcome, uh, Trevor. Uh, Justin and indeed Margaret uh, uh, to, to the meeting. Thank you for, for coming along. Uh, I am i don't have a huge number of questions at this stage. Uh, it is a work in progress that uh, uh, we're discussing and uh, like the Chair, we obviously look forward to receiving. The, the, so I don't have anything uh, in detail. Uh, maybe just make a, a couple of comments in terms of, uh, I suppose, Hopefully we, we develop a system or that we return to full examinations that we aren't looking at uh, grades awarded by statistics versus the human aspect of, of, of things. Uh, and I hope, hope that's where, where we actually end up. In terms of the consultation with the trade unions, uh, Justin, we've had some very good uh, positive engagements. Well, there may be different views and so on, but the, the trade unions have been very positive. We, we, we'd, we'd felt uh, and offered. Uh, so is that an, an, an ongoing situation of contact with the trade unions uh, on, on, as we develop these? And I suppose uh, I'm also in terms of the health professionals, uh, are you involved in discussions with the health professionals in how... Uh, whatever system we finally arrive at or whatever system that may need to, to be moderated uh, and you'd made reference yourself to you know situations where there might indeed be local lockdowns that have to be taken into account but those lo local lockdowns would have to be taken account of uh, very quickly um, and your ability to respond in an examination situation to, to those lockdowns I suppose uh, again in the <clears throat> to to pro to help our pupils who then want to move on to university in in England um, and the relationship between whatever system we evolve and the validity of that system uh, being held by the uh, English, Scottish, and Welsh universities. Um, so really, I suppose, as the chair says, until we get your, your, the next stage of this, those are sort of around my my areas of, I'm not going to say concern at the minute, but areas of interest at the minute. Um, and, and if I may respond, I'll take those each item. Um, the in, in regards to the unions, as I said, we in in pre consultation we took a cross section um, of unions, teachers, principals. Um, to try and, and, and gauge all views, and the unions have responded well to the consultation. We've received very um, detailed feedback, um, which we've been able to build upon in terms of our proposals. Um, the point you make around uh, differences of opinion, they, there are quite substantial differences of opinion emerging. Um, in regards to GCSE English and Mathematics, for example, there are some in favour of continuing, some representative bodies in favour of continuing with the idea of full assessment in GCSE mathematics and, 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 and other bodies with a similar nature very much against that. Um, and so uh, we, we do have a challenge of trying to resolve that. Um, unions were also able to comment on some of the proposals that we had made pre-consultation, even though we might not have engaged with that individual union, and be able to provide feedback on the differences as they, as they changed from June um, right the way through, and we were able to understand that and representation on that. On the, on the health side, um, certainly the health situation is fluid. And for our organisation, which is not a health organisation, to predict that far into the future is extremely challenging. I think it's challenging for, for everybody um, in society. And uh, from our perspective, we have engaged and we are part of the Education Restart Programme with the Department of Education. The Restart Programme is engaging with CMO and PHA. 
We're also working with now the Education Authority because we recognise that examinations, whether they're GCSEs or A-levels or music examinations or practical examinations, have to have consideration of the safety of the examination hall. And so there are factors in that which fall outside our domain, but we can provide advice on as well, um, and we continue with that. And then there's the issue of having enough contingencies, but not so many that we can't develop them all adequately, but enough contingencies that can build with full lockdown versus the operation of exams uh, with inside those exam halls in safety. And so there will be ongoing work um, through that in order to provide advice and guidance to, to schools. I think that uh, in regards to localised disruption, and, and we are aware of schools having to close for periods of time, particular years or particular bubbles um, around that. Obviously in our proposals that, that was the idea of, of the easement of burden of assessment because it would allow schools to focus on where that assessment um, and adjust for their teaching accordingly. There is, there is some evidence but it's limiting evidence on the diverse range of impact that localised lockdowns have. Teaching and learning obviously doesn't stop and face-to-face -face teaching is obviously of high importance and value, but at the same time we know that schools, and ex we have seen examples of schools being highly innovative in continuation of learning in that localised lockdown situation, and so actually introducing um, arrangements without that data or that information could be challenging for us in terms of having a standard around the qualification. The point you make around um, universities and university recognition going forward is a particular challenge. As I mentioned before, if we consider changes to, say, for example, SEER A-levels, but don't consider changes to other A-level providers, uh, and they operate out of England and under direction from Ofqual, we could end up with a diverse situation of, of differences of approaches. Um, and those differences of approaches are extremely difficult to manage with inside then a, a, a small population of learners in comparison in the Northern Ireland context. We are in discussion with um, UCAS, University Admissions Service, and we keep the Irish Universities Association and CAO up to date with proposals so that they're aware of how we're bringing proposals forward. In terms of A-levels, as you see there, we've provided changes in regards to the health situation, but we've, we've proposed to maintain the content approach. But in regards to GCSEs, as I said before, we have made further amendments. We have gone further in terms of burden but we have to balance that, that GCSEs are sometimes used in, in high demand courses, so we have to keep those organisations briefed uh, as we develop up those proposals. I just, Chair, in terms of the briefings and the correspondence and the discussions, are they positive vis-à-vis -vis the university across channel? Are they positive discussions or are there any concerns uh, about the approach that we might take? Finally, I think that um, an example for uh, GCSE maths and English, we have received uh, feedback from some higher education providers that they would like to sustain the full breadth of the assessment in regards to those subjects. So um, I suppose they are one side of the same of the coin in terms of the view. And if we were to omit out of English and mathematics, and, and given that teaching unions have, have expressed around GCSE English and mathematics concerns as of parents, have, as of young people. Um, how are we balancing that against the university recognition of that progression? And I think that this is, this is one of the bigger challenges that we face in terms of that advice. Okay, Thank you, Robin. Thank Thanks, Robin. Uh, Justin, what, what is SEA's uh, position as to whether GCSE English and GCSE Maths should be full assessment? In the, in the proposal, we set out that GCSE Maths and English should be full. Uh, and we lay out in the proposal that it should be full because we recognise it as a key qualification for progression, not just to university, but to employment. Um, we've seen reports over previous years about the value of literacy and numeracy, particularly in the workplace, and how employers view that. And we've also um, received feedback, as I said, from some principal representative groups and other bodies that it is of value in terms of academic progression as well. That being said, I think that there is a strong voice of opinion that we should apply a mission. 
In mathematics, Ofqual have proposed in England that there would be no omission or change to the content specification. And so this was a matter that we did discuss at length um, with the, the council yesterday, um, balancing that issue of burden versus continuity of learning and progression uh, to the next stage uh, in, in learning. And I think um, this, is, this is a very challenging balance to, to maintain. And how are you going to strike that balance? If I could just add there, I think it's important to realise that really we anticipate we'll still be in very unusual circumstances next summer. Uh, working with uh, the universities and others will be pointing out that they accepted what grades eventually came out this summer and will be asking them to uh, understand the position that these young people are going to be in and whatever range of contingencies have to be implemented. Uh, they're not going to be ideal, they're not going to be perfect, uh, but they will be applied in the best interests of fairness to as many pupils as possible. Okay, because um, obviously you have pupils that will have experienced that full curriculum in variable ways during a significant lockdown period. So, um, you referenced contingencies. What what are some of what are some of those balances? Some of those contingencies that you're going to propose um, to overcome that variable experience of the full curriculum if you are going to go with full assessment. I think that um, there, there we return to the Department of Education's investment at, at restart. I think that um, supporting learners in their teaching and learning and catch up, um, particularly in these two subjects, is crucial for those individual learners' success uh, in the future. However, in, um, in considering that, um, could we take a position of omitting an assessment and reducing, reducing burden. It's particularly challenging in regards to GCSE mathematics, because in GCSE mathematics there's an accumulative nature of the subject material, um, and we would want to ensure that learners are supported in developing that accumulative knowledge, even, um, even if we omitted an assessment. So omitting an asse um, allowing an omission of an assessment um, in, a, in a proposal doesn't negate the support that those young people still need in order to progress their learning and understanding of the subject, which is beyond, okay. beyond, the, scope of, beyond the scope of scheme. Okay, I'll bring in uh, Robbie Butler in next, but just to finish that uh, point, Justin, uh, I, another way to balance is, uh, put, is put forward is optionality. So what, what is the position with regards to any degree of optionality in assessment for GCSE English and GCSE Maths? In our original proposals, optionality was considered, um, and, and the proposals that we laid out, optionality was considered. But optionality is, um, while it has benefits, it also has particular challenges. If, for example, you were to create optional routes through pathways of qualifications, uh, through pathways of assessment instruments at this point, you would have to set out um, new sample assessment instruments. And feedback we've also received from uh, teaching unions, but also teachers, is that optionality might actually disrupt particularly low attainment learners in terms of their progress through the exam paper. So optionality, in, in effect, may also cause disadvantage rather than just advantaging this, this opportunity. Um, there are other issues um, as well in terms of um, ensuring that the curriculum is still being worked for. You would have to rewrite large components of the specifications. And I think that doing that in year may be uh, a challenge. Uh, I'd also hand over to Margaret at this point, because I'm conscious that Margaret has you know, strong understanding of, of the educational viewpoints on optionality. Well, before you do that, I'll qualify that slightly, and I'm eager to bring in other members. But uh, could, could limited, a degree of some form of limited optionality for which pupils can be prepared not be considered? I think that um, in our broad feedback, um, it, it wasn't a popular option. <laughs> actually with, with teachers um, particularly uh, in regards to the changes. There was some support for it, but it wasn't as popular, say, for example, with the idea of a mission. Okay, but I'm not getting the impression that you're about to advise omission. 
So what what is going to be the and and if you're telling me the balance is the engage program, that's pretty concerning. No, I think I think that we um, are not ruling out the the idea of admission. I think okay. that that you know that has to be considered in advice, okay. but we have to consider that um, okay. extremely carefully. Um, okay. As I said before, admission might um, might ease burden, but ultimately does it does it deliver advantage? Um, to learners as they progress beyond just the GCSE, um, that they use that skills and knowledge uh, uh, beyond, which is why we originally proposed it um, from a key qualification point of view. I presume your advice to the Minister will go as far as that, though, given the time scales that we are facing here? I think that um, in, in terms of our advice, we will lay out those, those okay. challenges. Yeah. Now, uh, keen to let Margaret come in on other questions as well, but can I bring Robbie Butler in? Thank you, Chair. Um, thank you, Trevor, Margaret, and, and Justin. Um, I got my first question um, is um, to do with, I think it was Robin that had, had talked a little bit about um, what the lockdowns may do, localised lockdowns. Justin, you spoke about the, the Fuji lockdown and lo localised lockdowns and the challenges that they might, they might um, give us. So, um, could you, I don't know if there's been any thought given to this, but um, what are how will localised lockdowns, not not bigger lockdown, but the localised lockdowns, be recorded and reported, and even measured uh, with regard to the impact on teaching and learning, um, and then any subsequent mechanism that might be needed to be used for awarding the grades. So if we do localised lockdowns, obviously are going to have um, very concentrated uh, detrimental effects on certain schools of pupils, perhaps. So in terms of, has there been any thought in terms of the mechanisms? That's going to be reported and recorded. Um, in, in in terms of loss of teaching and learning, the impact of lockdown, it's a matter for the Department of Education because um, that that is around the school provision of the teaching and learning. And um, as I mentioned before, it's a factor that you know, we have been fed into. So hence why we have had those proposals all along, which is easement of burden in assessment. Um, we are receiving from the department um, in terms of the restart program. Um, where the lockdown is occurring, but actually um, it's beyond the scope of what SEA can do to make an assessment of the quality and teaching received in that lockdown scenario. So there is teaching and learning still taking place, but the value of that teaching and learning is, is not, not in our, our scope. We, we just provide the assessment. But by easing assessment burden, at least we're hopefully providing burden easement to teachers, schools, and, and particularly young people. Um, so that we can cope with the disruption that they would face in, in a localised lockdown. If I, uh, I could add... Just, sorry. I, I was just going to... I mean, it, it is possible, Justin, that a, a lockdown may occur in one month and three months later, a lockdown occur in the same area, you know, a local lockdown. I... I may be speaking Sorry, out of Chair. turn, but okay. uh, yeah, Chair, go ahead, go ahead. Uh, we have an appeals process, and I, I would have thought that uh, localised lockdown and the impact that that might have on a cohort, especially uh, uh, with Robin's scenario that it's maybe multiple lockdowns, uh, if a school think that that has impacted not just in teaching and learning, but the young person's preparation for the examination, then I would have thought there's room within the appeals process uh, to listen to that after uh, the, the, uh, we go through the awarding process. But uh, I think it's probably at this point one avenue, uh, but I'd expect in uh, uh, next week the Justin and his team to come back with the range of contingencies and what we can do. I think that, that's an important word there, Trevor, contingencies, because the, 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 even looking at the impacts on schools at the moment, we're only open a couple of weeks and there's been quite a lot of lost learning. And the reality is for any awards and exams that are taken, there will be a cohort of children um, in certain areas who will have lost time in the classroom. There's nothing that beats uh, classroom learning. So uh, uh, the contingency is the, the, the important word there, I think. And I actually would disagree with Justin in some ways and that I would say that for the 2020 exams, absolutely, you couldn't have seen this, you couldn't have predicted it, you couldn't have built a contingency. 2021, actually, no, there needs to be something within 
the offering from CCEA actually to say that in the event that there are localised lockdowns at a trigger point of a, a, whether it's a unit of learning or whatever it is, then that either omission or optionality comes in. Well, optionality can't come into it, but omission possibly could. I'm struggling to get my head in them both <laughs> because they're, they're both signed the same, guys. So um, I just think we have... We don't have a lot of time, but we have time this time in regards we didn't have in 2020, Justin, to be fair to you and the thing. I think he's... Yeah. The, the, does Margaret want to come in there? Yeah. Sorry. Yeah, Margaret? Yeah, yeah if it's helpful. Um, uh, yeah, so we've, um, we've, we've started thinking about the contingency planning um, very carefully, and we had a good session with principals yesterday, and, and they were raising exactly the points that... Um, members have brought up today. So I think you're absolutely right, Robbie. We can't wait for the appeals process um, for 2021. And principals gave us really helpful suggestions on how we can perhaps consider layering, um, you know, contingencies and um, if we call it forms of compensation or how we could consider um, disruption and impact on, on learners. So they did talk about having... Um, ranges of disruption, um, but I, I do also agree with colleagues um, that you know we do need to agree the level of disruption or the ranges of disruption uh, with our colleagues at DE, EA, CCMS, so that we're we're all comfortable with the levels of of disruption and the ways in which we would manage them to ensure that learners are not um, in any way unfairly affected. Thank you for that. Thank you. Thank you, guys, for that. Um, um, we, we talked about maths and English, and, and I'm going to give Margaret a compliment here. I did. I was contacted by some uh, teachers who teach RE, and they were very concerned at the start, of just even as the consultation was starting. I emailed Margaret and got a response back probably within two or three days on, on RE. But then it, it, it had me thinking then, um, which and how many subjects do not have a reduced content? Do you have that information? There are in the proposal a range of subjects that don't have emissions proposed. Okay. Um, so at, at A level, obviously, any adjustments are on the basis of health grounds. At GCSE, the emissions that are proposed are both that and the easement of burden. So we come back that you know there is a, a built-in component with inside the GCSE of, of easement burden. Um, there are subjects that, if an emission was applied at a unit level they would either breach um, the awarding objectives, so languages. Um, the four units that are provided in the language qualifications each cover an individual assessment objective. And so if you remove a unit, you have a challenge of not covering the assessment objectives. Now, obviously, in languages, we've taken a lot of feedback, and there's a lot of public feedback on that, so we do have to actively consider um, how we achieve, how we square that circle and how we come up with um, a mission to support that subject. Um, in regards to um, religious studies, there are two units, both of 50%, so that, that, that would have breached the 40% rule. But again, uh, a lot of feedback around you know, fairness across subject areas, and so we have to go back and, and consider uh, that in terms of our proposals. There are some other subjects like economics um, and politics, um, again, have 50% balances, so again, in those small entry subjects, we'll have to go back and return to those subjects as well. Um, okay, and that, that, uh, the third question then is in, around the equity of subjects um, and uh, students who are really passionate about mental health and wellbeing, and, and a lot of the emails that I'm getting at the moment would be from, from students who are already struggling um, with either uh, anxiety that was already existed but has been exacerbated by perhaps the workload. Um, first of all, particularly in around GCSE uh, examinations, maybe double word science and that type of thing, um, and then the lack of clarity. So there's a, obviously there's a, there's, a, there's an urgency that is required to for getting information to parents, to pupils, and to teachers. And I, and I would like to see what, what that equity looks like across um, the subjects. And I understand that it's it's not easy because they're not all the same shape, but. I would like to see as much equity as possible for students, um, that we don't have a cohort of students who are absolutely, you know, because of choice of subjects, that they're, they're, they're um, having real difficulties. My final question, uh, Chair, that's okay. Mm -hmm. So um, I'm going to be, hopefully be clever with this one because it's not what you're here to talk about today, but it has an implication, as Margaret will know, for next year, because I'd say that if we don't look after the uh, assessors this year, we may, not have, we may not have assessors next year. So is there any update, Justin, on um, uh, assessor payments for this year? 
As I um, mentioned to the committee uh, before in regards to examiner assessment payments, um, it's, it's not within my gift as accounting officer to pay people for work that hasn't been completed or not contracted for. Um, we had put proposals to the department, we received feedback, we had to take second uh, opinion. We've received that opinion and we um, have been able to submit uh, new proposals uh, on that. However, um, just to give the committee some assurance for the work completed um, by those examiners, we have been able to make a payment and it's just shy of a million pounds. Um, so we have made payment for the work that is within the, the gift and I hope that um, and we have asked the department to make a quick consideration of that um, because we need to move forward. I think that in terms I think the committee has raised before about payments from other bodies and other boards. Um, we are an arm's length body of the Department of Education. Um, the only, the only similar um, position was probably SQA in Scotland which is also an arm's length body of the Scottish Executive. Um, and in regards to that, they uh, understand they're, they're in a, a, a similar position. Um, the, the other bodies, if you like, are charitable bodies and uh, private organisations, um, so they have different rules and restrictions um, um, based on them. Yeah, the only thing that I'd, I'd like to hear in there is a wee bit more positivity, as in this is a COVID, this is COVID and we're, we're, we're through many different facets of, of, of um, employment, we've found solutions um, mm -hmm. and certainly that I'm sure this committee would be of one voice with regard to that, that um, a lot of those people either rely on uh, annually, that is part of either a top of pension or as part of their work because it, it, it suits them. I understand that there's a lot of, there's, there's a lot of people that do it, there's, it's, it's, a high, uh, it's a high volume of, of yeah. individuals and it, it could be quite costly but, um, but I look forward to further mm -hmm. update on the further look, if I could just polls. add, uh, Council have felt a frustration at the pace of resolving this not just because the focus of the Assembly Committee has been on this, but we understand uh, the risk that's associated uh, with that cohort of mm -hmm. uh, people who either do have a contract or, uh, of employment or who will be used next year as markers. They don't have contracts, uh, but it's a frustration that it's dragged on this long, you know, and uh, Justin, uh, to give him his due, and uh, Margaret as well have done their level best to get to a resolution, but uh, I'll be taking it up again with the department. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. 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 Uh, members, uh, forgive me for supplementing a few questions here today. Uh, I just don't want us to miss anything. Um, Justin, um, what is the proposed approach to the assessment of speaking and listening in respect of modern languages, an issue that Robbie raised there? Um, in, in the proposal of consultation, um, as I mentioned before, some of the rules that we applied in terms of coverage of the assessment objectives and the 40% rule made it challenging. Um, we, have, we have received feedback and, and um, positive feedback of recommendations and suggestions of units that can be adjusted um, and AO objectives that can be distributed into other assessment instruments, etc. And we'll absolutely take those on board in, in terms of our advice going to the department. What is Ofqual's proposed approach? Are they um, including these in overall grades, recording a sufficient competency level that has been reached? Ofqual's of of, of approach is, is slightly different um, to ours. Uh, as I said, they haven't extended um, much beyond um, uh, minor amendments to subject content. We, we chose to keep the subject content alive. Uh, which is which is different, and then adjust the burden on the assessment instruments. So, from our perspective, actually, the feedback we've received is where we can reduce burden on assessment instruments, and then keep that equality of subjects, as, as Robbie outlines. Okay. Um, very quick second supplementary. R Robbie importantly raised differential experience between subjects. Um, it's my understanding in some cases, for example, GCE. AS level physics and chemistry that student practicals appear to be continuing, whereas for DCE biology and geography it appears that student practicals and field trips are proposed to be removed from the GCE A2 syllabus. Um, again, while for GCE music and performing arts live performance assessment will now be video, can you explain your approach to uh, your varied approach to practical examinations, field trips and assessed live performances. Why are we not treating all those subjects in the same way? If uh, through the chair I hand over to Margaret who will explain then, you know, in, in terms of subject variation. Um, well, I think, I think it's more about um, 
qualification differentiation. So, um, you know, the feedback that we had from principals uh, back in June, which informed the initial proposals uh, that we developed, were, were very clear that because of the number of GCSEs um, students take, um, which really, you know, are difficult to manage with a, with a very full timetable, it was really important that we um, focused as much as is possible on what we could do to reduce um, the assessment burden there. So I think it's fair to say that our proposals at GCSE have been um, really quite radical. Um, as we know, at AS and, and A2 level, um, students normally take um, three, possibly four. Um, so I think, um, you know, in terms of our discussion about the standard, um, there was definitely a desire to try and ensure that students who will be taking the sciences um, to go on to degrees um, in those areas, um, you know, it is, a, is essential that they are prepared as much as is possible um, for their next step in terms of that progression journey. Um, so I think we've done everything we can to ensure that amendments absolutely take into account uh, public health requirements, um, and as we know, um, by um, taking out the requirement for A-level students um, who would ordinarily have completed an AS, which forms 40% um, of the qualification, um, in Northern Ireland students are completing 60% of the A-level, which is different to students in England who are, at the moment, um, unless England changed their position, having to complete the full um, 100 percent at the end of uh, 2021. Um, I, I think and hope that we've got the right balance between reducing assessment burden without then um, jeopardising potentially uh, the ability of those students to progress. Okay. Um, uh, okay. Um, so you're, you're saying that you're leaving student practicals in at AS level. Um, because that's the stage at which you're envisaging students experiencing practical and you're taking it out at A2 level because they ought to have already experienced it at AS level? Is that what you're saying? Um, so I think the structure of, of the practicals, you know, is very different at A level. Um, so um, the things that we've been able to do for GCSE, you couldn't just automatically apply. Um, to A level, so it is, so it is quite different, I'm afraid. Okay. Very last supplementary. In terms of this debate around full assessment, omission, optionality. Another option, of course, is making examinations more accessible by varying additional material that is provided during the exam. Key dates, formula sheet, um, access to text. What what see as recommendation in relation to that as a potential balance? Um, for um, varied and lost learning time? Um, Chair, there's a, a range of different options in, in there. Um, I'll, I'll try and address as, as many as possible in terms of options that we did consider. Um, obviously, the, uh, the allowance of text would change the specification and uh, not just change the uh, assessment burden. And I come back to trying to keep uh, continuity and stability around the specification so that learners and teachers, particularly those who have already engaged with the specification, have continuity uh, between years. There is um, challenges in terms of, I think you mentioned timetabling of uh, examinations and uh, in our engagement um, across the board, there's a willingness to uh, keep the examination timetable at a point where it ends at the 30th of June. But we do we do respect that you know there might be some contingency weeks um, for other examination boards that are in discussion at the moment. But uh, I, I would be of the view of maintaining into the 30th of June because otherwise it, it might become disruptive in terms of maintaining examination centres open um, beyond that. I think that um, in regards to, we've had suggestions before in regards to digital examinations, could these examinations be taken online, at home? Um, the technology um, and deploying that technology, particularly to students in disadvantaged areas or disconnected from um, high-speed broadband would introduce, I think, significant risks uh, to the ability to operate those examinations. Um, in terms of providing support materials, we have provided uh, support materials for key areas 
but inside the subject specifications on our website contains already significant information and support in a digital format, and we've always worked towards digital formats so that that continue in terms of support in the learning progress as well, and we will continue to invest in that um, at this point in time as well. So hopefully I've addressed a few of the points you've okay. raised there. Uh, I think I have Daniel McCrossan um, available to us. Daniel? Yes, Chair. Uh, can you hear me okay? Yeah. I can, loud and clear. You go ahead there. Yeah, apologies, Chair, for the delay. I'm uh, actually currently isolating and have some technical difficulties in getting connected. So, no uh, apologies for that. We, we can hear you clearly now. Go ahead. Uh, uh, I'll just go straight into it. Uh, just now, so, some of these questions may have been asked uh, in the time that I had missed at the start. But uh, can you explain? Uh, the instructions that it was given that it was given earlier in 2020 by the minister, and the advice that CIA provided to the minister in respect of the great awarding models, and which uh, which were set aside on the 17th of August, was CIA simply asked to replicate the previous year's grade distribution? And finally, can CIA confirm that, in line with the committee's suggestions, a formal inquiry review uh, is now underway in respect of CIA's management of the grade awarding uh, crisis that unfolded in recent weeks? Um, in regards to the first question, in terms of maintaining similar grade distribution, CIA wasn't asked to do that. CIA was asked to maintain um, standards as far as possible, similar to previous years, um, prior to the change of direction on the 17th of August. That was the um, uh, original direction, so it was standards as similar as possible to those of previous years. Um, in the the second question, sorry, could I ask the same? A, a review. In, in regards to the review, um, I understand that, that that's a matter for consideration of the department and, and minister, and we, we wait the outcome of that consideration. Um, having said that, the points we made earlier about lessons learned internally, we did reflect back from SEER's perspective into the proposals, such as the removal of um, the approach of statistical standardization or retrospective standardization from A2 to AS model. Yeah, um, Justin, you, you'll know that I have raised considerable concerns about this entire situation for some months, uh, and I did warn you and the Minister in relation to some of the serious concerns shared with me as a public representative a member of this committee. I do feel that they were ignored, uh, and uh, I, I think to say that this entire crisis was mismanaged is a, an understatement of the century. There does need to be, and I'll put this firmly on record, an independent inquiry into how this uh, was handled, an independent review into how this was handled. Young people's lives were played with, and a lot of people were let down. A lot of people were disappointed. A lot of parents were very worried. A lot of teachers were failed. Uh, and I think that that is an entirely regrettable and unforgivable situation. And given what happened to the leadership of Ofqual and other bodies across England and other parts of the United Kingdom, uh, I think that there needs to be a serious level of accountability in relation to the actions that have happened. Uh, and I put that very firmly. Uh, uh, in terms of another question, Chair, uh, when it came to the comparable outcomes principle, do you now accept that uh, you were taking it too far when you tried to apply it uh, at an individual school level with small cohorts of pupils, uh, and this uh, caused anomalies? Also, uh, can you tell us, Justin, where there where there were less anomalies at were there less anomalies at GCSE uh, than AS and A level? And if there were, how do you explain that? Um, in, in terms of the comparable outcomes principles, the comparable outcomes principle is, is one that ensures that if a, a cohort of learners progresses um, between examinations and the examination instruments have uh, comparability, that the standards should be maintained uh, effectively over, over time. The comparable outcomes principle was different from the direction which was to maintain, maintain the standards. Um, in regards to the alternative arrangements um, in comparison with previous years. I think that um, in terms of the application of that data model or data system um, and down to individual school level, obviously um, one of the things we had to consider was maintain standards uh, between schools um, because schools had differentials in processes um, that they were applying in terms of reaching their sender assess grades. And albeit uh, recognition of, as I have done before, openly, that um, teachers and school principals put in immense effort um, to come up with those uh, centre assess grades. Um, it wasn't time to 
come up with a, a single standard at that point in terms of approach, rather we came at it from a guidance point of view. In regards to the question on GCSE versus AS and A-level uh, anomalies, we didn't complete the process in terms of GCSE uh, standardisation to the point of issue of results on the 20th because the new direction was uh, given to SEER on the 17th of August, which required us to alter um, our approach and therefore the GCSEs uh, that were issued were issued on the basis of sender assess grades. Yeah, uh, I uh, appreciate that you've recognised the tremendous efforts made by teachers and those at the coal face that have supported our young people through what has been a very challenging time. I've always accepted we're in the middle of a pandemic and that this challenge would never be easy. I did say that to you directly on numerous occasions. However, I still have great concerns about the, how this uh, was handled and how advice was ignored throughout the entirety of the process until ultimately the Minister did a U-turn uh, on a Monday afternoon. Uh, th that left a lot of people hanging in the balance and I I'm just really concerned as to whose advice uh, was being uh, given. Was he advising the Minister? Was the Minister advising C in relation to uh, this entire situation? Because up until that, on the Friday prior to the Monday, Justin, you sat at the committee in front of my colleagues uh, and said that you defended uh, the process, you defended the model. Uh, and yet on the Monday, we've seen a significant U-turn from the Minister. So I, I'm wondering, whose advice was the Minister taking, or was the Minister advising SIA? Uh, Daniel, uh, thanks for that. Uh, Council considered all available information. Uh, we give advice to the Minister on issues like this. The Minister then considers it, and uh, once he makes his decision, we have to implement it. Uh, and we have to implement it to the best efforts to be fair to as many candidates as is possible. So just, just to clarify, are you saying that SIA advised the Minister and the Minister followed SIA's advice or that SIA was under the direction of the Minister in relation to the action that was taken? In regards to um, SIA provided advice as was requested to the Department and uh, we then received direction um, in regards to how we were to implement the process. We followed that direction to the letter. The decision in regards to the Monday, in regards to A-levels, uh, was new direction from the Minister, um, SIA and SIA Council on that didn't provide advice. Um, and so we had to implement that direction. Now, as soon as we received that direction, um, we changed our entire system reissued results, um, had that engaged with UCAS and completed to students by the Friday um, on, on the direction of the Minister. And I come back that we, we were asked to take, um, directed to take a particular approach. We applied that approach um, and, and conducted that. And we also assessed all the options um, back in as early as March in providing the advice and the approach that would be taken. So just, just to be clear, uh, just for certainty, because I, I, I think there is still a significant level of accountability needed in relation to what has happened, uh, are you saying that the advice that was given to the Minister was then rejected on the Monday and the Minister then made a decision himself? Is it? So up until Monday, on the Friday prior, the Minister was taking his advice from you, Justin, and from others at SIA, and on the Monday, the Minister then made a political decision and changed path. Is that right? On the, f on the, on the Friday um, prior to the decision, we were implementing still as directed. Um, and we will, you know, we, we were asked to do a task and a job. Um, and in terms of the approach that we took to provide in those grades, we've outlined the, outlined the work that we did um, in regards to that. Um, on the Monday, there was a change in decision and we had to implement that decision on the A-levels. Okay, so just, just for summary purposes, uh, on, on, on the advice given by SIA to the Minister, the Minister followed the advice offered to him by the professional judgment and information that you and SIA had, and the Minister continued in that path, and as a result, thousands upon thousands of young people were failed and let down. The, uh, their grades were downgraded, they were described as anomalies, children were in tears, teachers were insulted. Are you 
so uh, am I right in saying today, and I, 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 I make no apologies for being blunt about this because the damage that was caused was significant. Am I right in saying today that that was the result of advice given by CIA? In terms of the advice given, it was the best solution that we could find in the arrangements. Yes or no answer. I, I want to know up until Monday the Minister was following your advice. So, sorry, in, in terms of providing advice, the advice was provided on the options that were available to us to conduct examinations. We were asked to carry out that work. We carried out that work. In terms of a change of direction, we then implemented that change of direction on the Monday. Um, in terms of our advice of available options, those were the options available, and those options were available if standards were, be, were to be maintained with previous years. Justin, do you think that the leadership of SEA failed on this occasion? I, I can take that question. I don't think no, it did. That's, well, sorry, that's a question for Justin first, please. I have direct, directly engaged with them over the last few months. In terms of the leadership of, of SEA, we were asked to give advice on the range of options that were available. We gave that advice. We then received instruction. We implemented that. Um, I believe that um, the organisation that is SIA did that to the best of its ability, given the time that it had to do it in, and given the situation that we all faced in regards to the pandemic. I believe that um, the work that was carried out was extensive in implementing that, um, and therefore the organisation did not fail in terms of leadership in the work activity. Our job was to implement that, and our job um, concluded with that with the grades on the 13th of August. Justin, I think you'll find that thousands of teachers and young people and families would disagree completely with your analysis and would say very clearly that the leadership of SIA failed absolutely, completely in on, on this occasion, and whilst also takes into consideration that we are in a pandemic, this was not easy, would also argue that the concern shared directly to SIA by many academics, one namely Dr Morrison, was ignored and it turned out that his predictions were accurate, as were the predictions of others, including myself and David Canning and others who had Zoom uh, meetings with yourself. Though the advice and the concerns were ignored because, to put it bluntly, Justin, say we're willing to die in the ditch for an untested model uh, with the, 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 that was very uncertain and that we warned would have detrimental consequences on a significant number of young people. Never did I imagine the amount of young people that were affected. So I think it's very clear that the leadership of SIA have failed. I'm going to ask you another question, Chair, if you indulge me briefly, and then yeah. I, I just have a final. Yeah, Dan, uh, just, just to say, I appreciate you had a, a particular line of question there, but you, you are well into your time, so if you have other questions, they need to be extremely brief and extremely concise, okay? Right, well, I'll, I'll, I'll skip this question and ask, ask my final point then, Chair. Uh, there has been changes of leadership across various uh, uh, examining authorities in the UK. Uh, Ofqual has also seen change of leadership. Uh, it is the view of many, uh, uh, particularly teachers and uh, young people and families, that there needs to be a serious level of accountability uh, and, in turn, a change of leadership at SIA to ensure public confidence in the organisation, to ensure that this does not repeat again. I have to say, Justin, after engaging in this process since last April, I have shared many concerns and I too uh, have the same uh, 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 issues that the leadership of SIA have not acknowledged the great amount of difficulty this has caused and have not appreciated that the, a huge amount of wrongdoing has happened and that they've ignored advice. I'm asking bluntly, Justin, do you believe we need a change of leadership at SIA to ensure public confidence and that this does not repeat again? In the last committee meeting where I presented to um, the Education Committee, I did apologise for the anxiety and worried calls to young people, their families and teachers. It was uh, not the intent of causing that, and we recognise that anxiety um, is a factor in the run-up to examinations um, in these circumstances. In terms of following through in, in the leadership, as I said, 
um, before we delivered what was asked of us. And the minister, I think, stated to this committee that particular fact. The review point of view, and I pointed out to this committee before, we are an organization open to review, open to learning. If there are errors or mistakes to be made, we will look and understand those. In terms of changes across the UK, um, and the point you made of changes in leadership, um, in terms of Wales and Scotland, uh, there has been no change. Um, and in terms of the approach taken, it was taken broadly across multiple jurisdictions, albeit that SIA had a different pathway in terms of implementation because of the data that was available to us. But we used data that was in the interests of individual learners where that was available to us, and we had some strengths in terms of the approach to the system. So we are open, we are open to review should the minister uh, wish to conduct that review, and I believe that that is with the Minister at this point in time. Daniel, let one? me Daniel, let me pause you there. I'll bring you back in again, but I'm conscious, uh, if memory serves me, let me just finish, Daniel, if memory serves me correct, that William has uh, an important, unavoidable commitment at 12 p.m. and offer him an opportunity to come in. I, I can come back to you, Daniel. Uh, William? William Humphrey, there. Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. O okay to go ahead, William. Hello. Yes, we, Hello. Can, hear, we can hear yeah. you clear. Yes. Um, yeah, yeah. Thanks. Can I just um, thank you very much, um, gentlemen, and, and uh, Margaret, for your uh, attendance today and for your evidence so far. Um, I think part of the problem that we have been talking about this morning is. You know, whenever you hear about the sheer level of the, uh, and the scale of the problem, um, I do hugely sympathise with the predicament that CF found itself in. Um, and obviously, uh, it is it is important when people talk about uh, the the unprecedented pandemic. Some people do use that in defence of colleagues and attack other colleagues around that issue. So I think we need to have some consistency around that. This is a this is a pandemic that n none of us were uh, expected to see or wanted to see. And so therefore, people were op operating in hugely difficult circumstances. And I, and I think um, no one wanted the outcome that we have. And I don't, want, I don't think it's a fair to be un unduly critical. Um, in terms of lessons learned, which the chair referred to earlier, I, I put this um, question to uh, the, the gentleman in our previous um, uh, section of the meeting. Can I just ask um, Jonathan in particular, or sorry, Justin in particular, what is the what is, is and are the lessons that have been learned from this? Do you think? Um, I think that in 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 the mouth of pandemic and in the loss of examinations, um, it, it was clear, and but it was always clear. Um, and clear to see a council uh, that examinations are well developed, well trusted, and well understood instruments. And once you lost those instruments, there were issues that whatever solution alternative arrangements would be put in place would have um, huge challenges associated with them. I think that the second issue is one in regards to standards. And the, the fairness um, or sense of fairness in regards to standards um, versus standards over time uh, and, and where that, that lay. And as I mentioned to the committee earlier today in our 2020-2021 proposals, and I think the question was asked um, about standards over time, there's no doubt that a degree of leniency needs to be considered because of the impact on, on young people. Um, and schools uh, going forward. I think that the, the third issue um, I would raise is that SIA in its primary legislation is required to maintain similarity with examinations in other UK jurisdictions. So we're actually bound to consider um, a similarity of approach 
um, when it comes to the provision of examinations or the provision of alternative arrangements, and that is a factor that is on, on mind, and that also spreads into the issue that I mentioned before. There is a hybrid of qualifications, particularly at A-level, um, where other providers um, operate in the market, and to have vastly differential approaches might have advantaged or disadvantaged um, learners through that particular process. I think that this committee um, previously has raised the challenges of communication, but the change was considerable and vast, but it was required to be considerable and vast to address the challenges that we faced in the loss of examinations. I think that anything beyond that is, is down to if the Minister does decide or not to commission review. Okay, thank you. I think one of the key things around all of these things from COVID as with much in life is communication and the dissemination of information is absolutely key. Getting the messaging clear and consistent uh, is, is key around these issues as well. And I think that's a lesson that everyone can learn uh, coming out of COVID uh, right across government. Um, Justin, you did also say that there were some positives that have been learned um, er around uh, the current situation. Could I just ask you to expand on that as to what those positives are? Certainly, um, we felt that, um, as I pointed out before, there was a huge amount of work by both teachers and school principals and, in fact, uh, all sender principals to work with us in the development and in insertion of grades. Um, and providing grades back. That work was done in extremely fast time um, with lots of advice and guidance uh, provided by us uh, to make sure that it was done as safely as, as possible. And I think it's a credit to the, the wider work in between the education system, teachers, principals and SEA in developing that approach. We developed IT solutions uh, rapidly that captured all that information without error or, or issue in terms of them being able to use that information and carry that information forward into the process that we developed beyond that. I think that um, in terms of building um, rapid uh, solutions, um, we, we have shown that we can be agile in the most extreme of circumstances around this, and so we can be innovative in the options that we are, we are using going forward. I think that there are some technical limitations I pointed out before around you know, any decision to use digital examinations, et cetera, wouldn't be possible. But um, I think we've shown that we have innovation and, and particularly independence at the GCSE um, qualification type. And, and that maybe is because we're less limited uh, by the fact that we, we have um, and SEER qualifications a considerable amount of the, the market share. So it gives more options to SEER uh, on that basis. So I, I would take those as positives that we would take into any arrangements for 2020, 20, 2021. And if I, if okay. I could just add uh, also, uh, the process leading up to the consultation and what has been happening during this, uh, Margaret and her team have engaged with uh, hundreds of school principals, uh, and that's been a very positive uh, engagement and I think I'd want to put it in record that uh, there hasn't been a groundswell coming back from those groups uh, that they want to change in leadership uh, uh, as a result of what's happened uh, this year. Um, Chair, can I just one quick question? Or, or am I, Go ahead. My time? Go ahead. Yeah. Uh, but perhaps you should declare an interest at this moment in time that um, uh, Mr. Carson is a former teacher of mine. I um, don't know whether I should declare that or not, but um, put it on um, in terms of get your own back. He's wearing better. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll, I do want to be put in detention. Can I just ask Trevor in relation to the um, CEO Council? Uh, how is that appointed? Uh, we're all ministerial appointments, uh, William. Uh, well, in fact, uh, in uh, the coming months, you'll see an advert appear uh, for a new chair of SIA. Uh, it's open uh, competition, uh, but at the end of the day, the selection process is rigorous. I would say that, of course. Uh, but uh, then the minister uh, will appoint not just the chair, but uh, every council member. So we are appointed okay. independently uh, for the, the expertise that we bring uh, to
to the table uh, to give the level of advice uh, that's based on years of experience across the education sector. Okay, thanks, Chairman. Thank you, Chairman. Yeah. William, thank you. Um, bring uh, Catherine Kelly in at this point. Thank you, Chair, and thanks, Justin, Margaret, and Trevor. Um, for joining us this morning. Um, firstly, I have a couple of questions here and a couple of comments, so I'll just get right to it. Has there been any engagement with the union since the closure of the consultation? Um, the, the consultation closed last Monday, um, and we spent the week analysing the, the results. Um, I'm not aware of in engagement in that because obviously our time was spent looking at the responses that those unions gave to us uh, across the board. Yeah, it's um, just because the last two weeks where we met um, different union representatives, um, their main issue was the fact that there was very little communication um, between SIA, uh, coming from SIA or the Department of Education. Um, so that's something that um, I think would probably need to be looked at going forward, um, especially when they're... Uh, they're the, the professionals and they're able to give an analysis from the ground and knowing what the impact would, would actually be. Um, just to move on, um, I'd just like to make a point in relation to the subjects um, where there has been no propo proposed reduction, um, and in particular maths. Maths is one of the heaviest subjects at GCSE and it was certainly never one of my best subjects. Um, but to put myself in the position of a GCSE student this year, um, undertaking maths with all it entails, um, knowing that at least a pass is needed to progress to the next stage of education, um, that you possibly have eight, nine, ten or more other subjects, and with a huge loss of teaching time, the pressure is immense, um, and pressure, that pressure is on pupils and pressure on teachers. Um, and similarly um, in the languages as well. Um, I am concerned about the decision to remove the assessment of practical skills from the single award science, um, but retain them with the double award science. Um, does that not discriminate um, against pupils who are possibly from disadvantaged backgrounds? What is the rationale for this proposed uh, speci specification um, and are SEA using equality impact assessments where pr proposals such as this may adversely imp impact on our young people um, and what assurances can you give that equality impact scrutiny will inform your final proposals? Could I take the first point? Uh, thanks for that Catherine. Uh, one of the things that we identified pretty early on in council uh, was the uh, I would say lack of uh, pace of the communication strategy that we had uh, and to be honest it was having to change virtually every day because something else would uh, come out of the woodwork and you'd have to uh, adapt to that uh, but certainly uh, at our uh, not yesterday's meeting, the previous one uh, council uh, suggested instructed uh, just in this team that we want a clear communication strategy, not just about what's happening in uh, 2021, but also uh, the fact that uh, where there has been any loss of public confidence, that we look at how we can address that. And we know that there's thousands of young people out there who have got a grade, who have progressed to uh, higher education, or they've got into their sixth form. Uh, so we want to make sure that we reassure them as well that whatever comes out this year, that they can have confidence that uh, the, the outcome for them is reflective of the ability that they have and that it's not uh, going to discriminate against uh, people from a, a disadvantaged background or advantage anybody from a, 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 a better off background. So communication is absolutely a key thing moving forward. Once we get decisions about what's happening from the Minister, then that will also be a high priority for us, Catherine. In response to the other questions, I think um, I picked up the question on languages before. Um, the 
uh, assessment objectives with inside the languages are divided across the four units and made it particularly challenging uh, for us to consider the options. However, we have received strong feedback in regards to the languages and we'll have to take that on board in any advice that we would provide. That is all languages, including um, Irish Medium and Gaelga, uh, which we, we will have to consider in that for the balance of the option of a mission. Am I getting a come back that the idea of an option of a mission is to ease burden um, through that assessment and to ensure that we're not um, disproportionately burdening some subjects over others. And I think uh, a member already pointed out it's challenging taking that approach because of the unit structures with inside it, but I, I think we have to take that, that, that on board. In terms of mathematics, um, I think I, I did point towards the challenges of that earlier in terms of a subject. Whilst you could ease assessment burden, there's still learning to be undertaken in the progression, and I recognise that that's a challenge for, for learners. Um, but the, the, the learning has to be undertaken to make sure that the learners have the knowledge, skills and understanding and can demonstrate that um, through the examinations process. I think we have to take on board um, the points made earlier. That there is a difference of opinion where some people do believe that we should retain all units and some people believe that we should admit units. Um, if you admit units, does that um, provide space? Um, that's our general approach to that. Does that provide more space for catch-up? in terms of teaching and learning. The other advantage we do have in Northern Ireland is that um, there is a January examination series in order for learners to capitalise on learning that's already undertaken, uh, and that might present opportunities as well for some centres and some schools. But I do think it does come down to um, investment in teaching and learning in, com in combination with the assessment instruments. And I point back to the, the department's restart programme. I think that maths is one of the areas where uh, investment could be uh, well spent. And just uh, two more, two more questions, Chair. Go ahead, Catherine. Um, will uh, Year Eleven modules count towards GCSE? Um, I'll, I'll hand over to Margaret here because she can explain where we are in terms of admission and, and Year Eleven position. Okay, thank you. Um, yes, yeah, so I think I think the question is about Year Eleven students who were due to take um, units in summer 2020. Is that That's it. right, Catherine? That's yeah, it, yeah. So I think um, again, going back to the uh, proposals that that we originally put forward um, back in June, they were radical. So we did hear um, loudly and clearly, I think, from principals. Um, that the pressure perhaps particularly at GCSE did need to be addressed and that it would be important um, to look at omitting units so that teachers could get on with the teaching and learning um, of all GCSEs but reducing the assessment burden on students. Um, and I think that whilst we went through a very rigorous process and we've had the discussions um, with our colleagues in SEA regulation and DE about maintaining um, the integrity of qualifications, ensuring all assessment objectives are covered, and we had um, the principle set uh, that no more than 40% of a GCSE uh, should be omitted, I think the really helpful thing about being able to go to consultation um, is that we have heard um, very clearly from principals and heads of department that um, they do think um, that the units um, that were um, due to be taken um, in summer 2020 um, should not need to be taken at the end of summer 2021. Um, so that message has come through very clearly in the consultation um, and it will be, it is reflected in the advice that we are putting forward uh, to the minister. So I don't think we can say definitively today what will happen, um, but I think we received um, a clear direction from schools uh, in the consultation. Thanks. Thanks for that, Margaret. I think um, if, it, if that does go ahead, I think it'll be a big relief, um, especially to our young people um, who from June um, have been in contact with me and also their parents. Um, and just lastly, uh, for clarity, um, and in relation to this year's grades and from SEA's own analysis, is it the case that when, that when it came to predicting grades, that students in non-selective schools had grades downgraded disproportionately in comparison to those in grammar schools? 
Um, in, in regards to GCSE, obviously we didn't complete the work, so the grades that were awarded were the centre assessment grades. Um, in terms of changes of grades, there were more changes of grades in, ter um, in terms of the standardised outcome. They were more different to the grades provided by practitioners from the centre. But as I explained to the committee before, um, there were more changes of grades in the lower grade in the lower grade boundaries, um, and therefore that had an effect in terms of the, um, the grade changes uh, in regards to school types um, at, at that point in the in the A level uh, approach. Um, but outcomes, as opposed to predictions, um, would have risen would have risen for um, non-selective schools as opposed to selective schools. And, and, and rose further um, with the change of direction. Thank you. Thanks, Chair. Hey, Catherine, I think Deputy Chairperson Karen Mullen is with us. Karen? Yep. Yep, thank you, Chair. Um, thank you, Justin, Trevor, and Margaret. Um, and I apologise if I go over any old ground that, that may have been. Um, covered while I was out. Just wanted to pick up on a, the minister or member, Mr. Humphreys, had asked, um, and the, Justin, you give an answer around the review. Um, we we had obviously got an update from yourself in August, where we were saying that SIA will be carrying out a review. Just to learn. Obviously, we all have to learn the lesson. We learn, you know, maybe from what happened, and it is unprecedented times. But uh, are you now saying that the minister is going to commission a review? You're awaiting that, or it, are C is still carrying out a review? I think um, my my understanding was um, that this committee wrote to the minister in the department um, in regards to review, and um, I understand that um, the minister is considering that. Um, in regards to our own internal work, um, as I said, we we did reflect on lessons learned. Uh, in regards to our approach and then fed that through from the 13th of August to the launch of the consultation on the 24th of August, um, the, the removal and the change in regards to the AS calculated grade, for example, was one of the substantial changes that we had to make immediately um, out of that, that review, um, that internal process for us. But we, we are, like I said, understanding the Minister's considering whether SIA would face a review or not. Uh, and uh, if, I, if I could just add, uh, yes. Our Audit and Risk Committee will obviously be taking a very, very close look at this uh, and to see if there are any lessons learned. Uh, if there is an independent review carried out, obviously we'll take account of that and the other reviews that are going on throughout uh, the jurisdictions uh, because obviously uh, in the interests of uh, the well-being of young people, we want to make sure mm -hmm. that we do everything possible. Uh, to make sure that uh, this doesn't uh, recur if it can possibly be avoided. Yep, thank you, Trevor and Justin. In relation to the value of the AS levels that were awarded um, this year, I think that SIA does need to rethink on how their value is retained and carried over. I understand um, the situation in present and how it is not possible to marry a grade with a mark, but can SIA consider providing the highest mark associated with a grade that has been awarded? Um, th thank you for that. Um, yes, the, the, the point of AS was that when we allowed the grade to be awarded in the AS for summer 2020, it was to facilitate students, particularly students who were considering applications to say, for example, foundation degrees, where the AS might count towards um, points for entry so that we didn't deny learners the opportunity to progress. Um, that was a grade awarded as opposed to a numeric um, outcome awarded and makes it difficult for that grade to be counted uh, towards the A-level grade. If, um, if the AS as a raw grade uh, counted towards the A-level grade, it could only be in the case of um, SEER examinations 
And I've pointed out before that there are other awarding organisations operating within inside the jurisdiction, and those other awarding organisations, um, if they were to operate a different policy on that, it might, advan it might advantage SEER candidates over non-SEER candidates within, within uh, the North. That would create um, a particular challenge around certain subjects. For example, um, psychology and sociology is not offered by SEER, and there are candidates who are working towards those specifications and outcomes at this particular time. And they would have a, a linear A-level point of view and wouldn't have an AS grade. Um, given that the balance, I believe, of those entries would likely be gender female balance, it probably would cause a, a, a gender disadvantage as well. It doesn't mean to say that we couldn't work towards that idea or consider it further, maybe as part of contingencies, but I think that um, it, it would have to be considered very, very carefully. Yeah, I suppose it's it's you know maybe the the work with the other awarding bodies to see if they will also consider. But Justin, you're right. This the the obviously say part of the cont contingency plan planning would be be included in that. Um, I don't know whether that's feasible to be able to work with the other bodies um, and see if they would also do that. Um, in, in terms of the other awarding bodies, they don't offer the AS component because, well, they, they offer it independent, but it's not coupled to the A2 component in the overall outcome. So the option, if you like, isn't available to them, even if we ask them to do it. Um, the, and, and the grade doesn't exist necessarily for those candidates to carry forward. So if you like, it's an option <coughs> unavailable um, <coughs> to consider in, in, in the balance of things. Um, if it was provided as a, a limiting grade as well, it might not um, reflect um, you know, outcomes in terms of A2 and, and preparation for that. But again, I come back, a contingency option that we can keep under review, but I don't think it's a, a, an option that we would apply at this time. Thank you. Um, I'm sure all our members have already uh, covered this. Uh, very, very concerned about the young people who are who have obviously missed the, the time that they missed. But even coming back now in September, we're already seeing sporadic closures um, in schools, classrooms, children off. Um, I'm going to declare an a an a conflict of interest. My daughter's in year 12 um, uh, and she's already been off twice um, since she has went back. Uh, so we're seeing interruptions to their learning very early on and there doesn't seem to be any acknowledgement of this or the likelihood of this, you know, um, in the state proposals going forward for the grades. How do you propose to uh, deal with it and what is plan B? Um, as, as I mentioned to the committee before, um, we, have, we have been very innovative in terms of assessment burden. Um, where we can make changes is in, in regards to assessment and reducing that assessment burden um, allows learners time and space, um, particularly in, the, in regards to the impact of loss of learning or disruption uh, with inside the work. I recognise that you know, there is a point where I think somebody in the committee made the point around the tipping point or the, the balance or the threshold where disruption becomes such that you have to move to um, other contingency arrangements. And as um, we've outlined already today, we're in consideration of those contingency arrangements actively. We'll be bringing those forward to council um, in order to uh, have prepared alternative strategies if that disruption becomes such that we have to take an alternative approach. Um, that, that being said, um, with the discussion that we've had already today around potential amendments to our, to our proposals as well, in terms of the balance and equity across qualifications, there is a, there is a considerable amount of omission within inside the assessment arrangements to, to counter that disruption um, at, at this point, um, and that's why we want to proceed with those proposals. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. That's me. Thanks, Karen. Uh, can I bring Justin McNulty in? Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Justin. Thank you, Margaret. And thank you, Trevor, for your important uh, evidence today. Um, I have constituents who now take part, sorry, who have to now take a gap year, and they are holding an offer for either Queen's or 
University of Ulster and those offers were withdrawn. Now their grades have been upgraded, they are left sitting on a waiting list or indeed have been offered a place for next year. Do you and CTA take responsibility for the mess they are in? I think that um, the, the, the points I've made to the, the previous committee, obviously um, in any exam series we don't want to cause anxiety um, or, or worry within the learner or the, or the teacher body. We were faced with the cancellation of examinations. Um, we were faced with a range of alternative approaches and considerations and when we chose to proceed forward with um, sender assess grades, uh, we made that conversion as rapidly as we possibly could to make sure that those new grades were issued to universities and those places could be sought. Um, I recognise that some of the universities have increased their places, but for operational reasons and are able to facilitate those places. I, I, I can't comment on, on the reasons or, or, or rationale behind that, but certainly the grades were, were issued. We've also um, invested heavily in the appeals process to make sure that rapid conversion of any issue in terms of appeal is addressed so that learners have their grades should they wish to proceed or await in clarification on, on that. Um, SIA delivered a change uh, in approach on A-level grades within five working days, um, got that information out into the system, worked with UCAS, uh, to alleviate any further anxiety and burden. I think that the, the options available in the cancellation of examinations, when we were faced in the mouth of the cancellation of the examinations, were limited. Um, and they were limited by the factors that I think I explained uh, earlier um, regarding continuity of standards, um, similarity of approach, and also availability of time to address training and development um, within inside the system um, were all significant challenges to what we had to do. Okay. Um, do you have any idea of the numbers involved, Justin? Um, I, I, I don't because that's a, that's a matter for university admissions. I can tell you that from an appeals perspective, um, I believe that there were approximately 1,300 uh, appeals in total uh, to date. Um, the majority of those were before the decision. I think we received about 500 of those after the decision on Monday the 17th of August. We've been able to clear the vast majority of those um, appeal issues in rapid time. And actually, in comparison to a previous year, we're at very low numbers um, and statistically probably less than five in terms of the appeals process that the team are finally working through. All at the moment are within sight the time, the time scales, the normal time scales um, for JCQ uh, consideration. Uh, and, and we have invested significant resource in resolving those. Okay, and um, listen, I do appreciate we're in, in chart, I'm oh, sorry, we're in uncharted waters and it's very difficult and complex. Uh, Please to move forward in terms of exams and exam results, but there still have been major difficulties, and we're really, really struggling with is the fact that the opinion of teachers um, and principals was sought and then was subsequently ignored. Um, I think other issues have already been, uh, been dealt with. Um, Graham, but I'm, I'm still struggling. I'm sorry, Justin, but I'm still struggling with that. In your letter of the 14th, uh, responding to the committee, um, you still that's. You had um, gone back to the department before responding to us with the data requested. Um, is it not up to the committee to decide what they do with the data and not to the department? Why are you consulting with the department as to whether we should get data or not? Is that not up to us as a committee to decide upon what is done with the data that we have sought? Um, I believe the original request for the data that you referred to was actually to the department and to the minister. Um, in, in mm -hmm. terms of supporting the, the committee, um, I, I acted to provide that data. Um, I was provided with clarity that that wasn't the data that the depart that um, you required. Um, in terms of then um, <coughs> putting that additional data together, because it was a request to the department, I did share the request with the department. Um, as I've outlined then to the Education Committee, um, the Department has 
shared its concerns. I'm only passing those on. Um, I provided the data again. Um, I understand that there's more requirements or, or changing requirements that is needed, and we will engage with the committee. Um, I, I seek to give the committee the, the data it needs in the format it, it needs. Um, and, and I've outlined that in the in the response that I provided this week. Okay. In terms of the data, you know, I think there, there is precedence there. You know, if we if we request data, I would like to know what the protocol is. If we request data from anybody, should that data not be provided without questions asked for us to decide upon what 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 is done with that data? In ter in, in terms of um, providing the data, it's a complex data set that that has been asked for. Um, it is a, a data set that dates back many years for SEER examinations only, um, and it was to try and seek clarity to ensure we actually facilitate the, the committee, and, and as I said in my latest letter, we, we just seek to do that. Yeah, that's not, I understand. It could be very complex data um, that we requested, Justin. However, that's not the question. The question is, why was the data not provided when requested, and why was it put back to the? I know the, the, the data was originally asked for through the department, but the department do not need to answer to us to say that we 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 are privy to data or otherwise. It's up for us to decide what we do with the data, not for the department. Is that not correct protocol or correct precedence here? The, the the data was originally provided, but then I received feedback that it it wasn't sufficient against what was asked for. Um, so the, the a data set was provided. Um, and then in the, the, the second data set, which I have provided following that clarity, um, I'm just outlining the concerns shared with me by the department. Um, I am an arm's length body, or SEER is an arm's length body of, of the department, um, and we keep the department informed of those types of data requests. Um, the, the data has been provided. Um, it hasn't been. The, the data hasn't been provided as requested um, initially, um, so the department can decide now what data it can provide to the, the Committee for Education on its own whim, essentially. Okay. Um, I mean, we will continue to work with the committee, as I said, if there's a particular format or amendment that is required, we'll continue to work with the committee to uh, amend that, but um, the, the data was provided on Tuesday and previously the data that we thought the committee required was provided as well, but it turns out that that wasn't the data that was required. We, we wish to work with the committee to find out exactly um, how we need to change the, the data set so that we can proceed to inform the committee correctly. Yeah, the, my, my concern isn't necessarily around this specific data set, Justin. My concern is around the precedence here whereby we have requested data on the department is refusing to provide that data to the committee. Um, that 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 you know any any data requested from the department and its non-provision of data is a question of the department. But from a SEER perspective, um, I've tried to facilitate the committee in the information that you saw and provided that this week with outlines of um, the points received back from the department. I recognise that, Justin, I'm grateful for that. And I appreciate putting you in a difficult situation when you shouldn't necessarily be speaking for the department on this. But from my, my perspective, I feel there's a precedent set here where we have requested data from their department and they're refusing to provide it. So thank you very much for your evidence, Justin. Thank you. Thanks, Justin. Uh, Morris, Bradley. Uh, yeah, thanks, Chair. Uh, uh, like you, Chair, I think, until we see the results of the consultation, there is not a big lot that we can comment on. However, uh, I would ask that SIA take on board the lessons that have been learned through hindsight. Uh, if hindsight is foresight, then none of us would ever make a mistake, but it's not. Uh, and uh, the secret of making a mistake is turn the mistake into a lesson and learn from it, and I hope that that's what SIA intend to do. Sorry, excuse me. But well, can I ask that CS take on board as wide a range of opinions as possible, from teachers to unions? Uh, they had previously uh, cited concerns, including the pre-consultation on changes to the curriculum, inconsistency in the level of curriculum content, absence of a time scale, clear curriculum direction. Uh, I've also got concerns that sports and uh, field trips could be sacrificed uh, going forward, and I'm not very happy about that.
Um, Can I respond? Yes, yeah, yeah. sorry. 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 Um, in, in, in terms of the wide range of opinions, as I set out in the opening statement, um, SIA during the period of June engaged with approximately 300 practitioners at a subject level um, to take on the views of a cross section of schools about the approaches that we may take. Um, I think that at a subject level, some subjects there was agreement and commonality, and in other subjects there was a diverse range of opinions, and we had to find um, centre grounds and, and positions. And that was really a pre-consultation period, developing up the consultation responses, and then also us involved in the department over time. I think that um, bringing those forward to council allowed council to consider the range of options and approaches. And as I mentioned earlier, our approaches were ready to try and create a consistency of approach, but subjects are created and function um, in different ways, so we had to also recognise that uh, simultaneously. But a consistency in approach at least allows then school leaderships and the wider education system to understand um, the, the, the commonality. And I've pointed to the fact that we have received feedback on some subjects where we haven't been able to provide that common approach around emissions, say, for example. And in doing so, you know, we'll take that on board in terms of any advice that uh, we may provide through council. I think that um, in regards to the level of content, the, the, the content and the specifications as they existed uh, or do exist were already consulted on uh, widely when we did the revision of specifications. And at that time, many teachers um, helped us build those specifications. I think that there will always be um, a level of concern about the burden and difference of burden um, with inside the content, but the approach that we've taken is by admission of assessment is to alleviate burden and allow teachers to focus on particular pathways um, and, and support teachers through teachers and learning. Um, I, I'm unsure about the issue of support for teachers. Um, SIA has over the years invested considerably um, on materials, content, and information for teachers. It is all available in a digital format. Um, so from a, a kind of resilience perspective, in regards to the pandemic, that information is available on our website. And in fact, that support for teachers is broken down by key stage through the Northern Ireland curriculum and subject matter and relates back to the individual specifications as well. And that still remains available and, and I believe uh, should be used. I think that while our, pro our proposals were broad and our proposals uh, were um, innovative, particularly at GCSE, they went further than other jurisdictional proposals and that maybe is part of um, us reflecting on where we were post uh, the summer 2020 award. It's part of those proposals um, we have received feedback and, and as we pointed out today, I think we do have to take on board some of that feedback and consider it, particularly in regards to maths and English, particularly in regards to language and religious studies. Uh, and then that maybe comes back to the point made earlier about balance of, of equity. But that's the point of the, the, the full consultation. Um, and in the full consultation, we have received feedback from a broad range of unions, teaching bodies, representative bodies, employers, higher education institutes. Um, and we've, we've had to very rapidly take those seven, over 7,000 views and come up with a proposal that attempts to meet as many of those views as possible. But um, I think that as with, with anything that we propose around this, there will be some uh, views that we're just not going to be able to address. Thanks very much for that, Justin. Uh, we heard earlier uh, this morning in a presentation that uh, the system that had been devised was, was fair. Uh, so that's, that was a good outcome. However, can I ask that um, going forward that you look for consultation with the committee, communication with the committee, and most importantly, clarity? Uh, Thank you, Chair. And, 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 and I appreciate that. Um, as I said before um, in the letter issued to the committee earlier this week on data, we wish to work with the committee um, wherever possible and provide the information that, that you seek. Thanks, uh, Justin. Um, conscious, I, I did uh, cut Daniel somewhat short earlier in order to let a member in that had a, a, a particular um, agreement. Daniel, would you like to ask a brief supplementary? Yeah, it's good to touch on the anomalies uh, situation here. Uh, why was it not appropriate to resolve the anomalies via the appeal process in the first place, Justin? The process was going to take far too long to facilitate pupils 
who were seeking business in university, despite the declared intentions of SIA uh, in terms of prioritising in some cases, many have fallen through the cracks. Um, your repeal mechanism has been uh, uh, has failed a lot of people. Effectively, but my, my main point here is uh, why uh, why was it appropriate to resolve uh, the anomalies via the appeal process in the first place after significant warnings from some? Justin. Thank you. Um, in, in terms of the appeal mechanism and its current operation, um, as I said, we are all within um, JCQ timelines. We are dealing now with individual cases in terms of independent appeal um, and the vast majority of appeals and outcomes. The vast majority of appeals and outcomes have been resolved to date. I recognise, and in the figures I gave earlier, that the level of appeal um, declined rapidly post the change in direction on the 17th of August, um, but we have been able to deal with those appeals and have invested um, a huge amount of time and support. I do recognise that, as with any any year around examinations, there are always going to be um, individual complex cases, uh, and we will work with parents, teachers, schools um, as they resolve those or those come to us for independent review. I think that in terms of anomalies and, and how to address them through the appeals process, even in a year where examinations exist, there are errors um, in regards to marking uh, of examinations, and when you have a, an error in marking or an error which results in a, a disputed grade or a dissatisfied grade, it would come through on the basis uh, of an appeals process. So the appeals process is the right and proper place to address um, discontent with inside the system. I think that um, in terms of uh, error um, being produced, as I outlined before, um, we were dealing with uh, the majority of the appeals um, prior to the decision, and we had scaled uh, the appeals process. That's not to say that we didn't recognise that the appeals process would always be challenging to function um, during that time, and um, we, we knew it would be challenging to function both uh, at day level, but uh, given the, the scale of GCSE entries, it would be a process that would be challenging to function at the GCSE point. It just seemed that uh, Justin, you, you, know, you knew plenty, but in hindsight, a lot of the concerns have been confirmed uh, and have been ignored. The, the reality is that thousands of young people have been uh, badly affected, as have teachers, schools, parents, people right across Northern Ireland. All of us as elected representatives have had to do what we can to support them in relation to this. The, the, the concern I have is in relation to C, there's a there is a real lack of transparency in relation to all the protests, even this consultation of which there's no written analysis provided that has been touched on by another member of the, of the chair, I think, uh, and also uh, in relation to um, advice that has been given or shared. There's just a huge amount of issues that I have, and to be blunt and honest about it, just I have no confidence uh, in this process whatsoever, and I have no confidence in the leadership of SIA. I do believe that young people were let down and there was a willingness within SIA, even despite all the warnings given, that young people would pay the price for this pandemic regardless of all the warnings that were there. And I do believe there needs to be a serious level of accountability within SIA in order to restore public confidence in this body and move us forward. And I make no apologies for that. I've been through this process for months now and I did give sufficient warnings. I'm asking two, two very brief points in there, yes and no answer. Do you believe, Justin, that it is absolutely necessary in order to restore public confidence and say that an independent review take place and the minister should grant, the minister should grant it? And secondly, do you believe that your position as the leader, uh, as a leader of SEA, as the chief executive of the organisation, is tenable? Okay, thanks, Daniel. In, in terms of um, uh, review, as I said, SEA is a learning body and is open to reviews. Um, we will have. Uh, people who will always ask us questions and look at the work that we've done, as was pointed out by the chairman. Um, we will also have auditors look at work that we do and external auditors who look at the work that we do as well. And if the minister um, chooses to commission an independent review, we will support that review and provide any information necessary um, in terms of open and transparency. I come back to the point that I made earlier from a SEER perspective and from a personal perspective, SEER um, carried forward the work it was asked to do. It did it in exceptional circumstances. It did it um, with absolute uh, clarity and focus in terms of providing that. There were um, some uh, 
exceptional um, items of work done, both in conjunction with the teachers and leaders of schools, but also internally in finding an alternative process in the un and, and it was in the exceptional circumstance that we chose to cancel exams. And never before in, in a history uh, of SEER or a history of other awarding bodies have we chosen to cancel examinations. And in that situation, SEER did what it was asked to do. And if I, if I could add, uh, Chair, uh, as I tried to say earlier, uh, as Chair of SEER, uh, Council, Council and myself, are content that Justin uh, carried out his duties uh, to the best of his ability and we were content with the performance that we as an organisation uh, implemented all that was asked of us within a time frame uh, that uh, was challenging. Uh, but we are certainly, I am content that uh, Justin has performed as well as he possibly could. And I am in no doubt that no other a change in leadership wouldn't have provided uh, a different outcome. OK, uh, we're, we're well over time here, folks. But I, I had one subject-specific issue that I had committed to raise today, if I could do so really quickly. Justin, um, GCSE physical <coughs> education is normally three components. Um, one component one external assessment 25% component two external assessment 25% component three a controlled assessment counting for 50% of the grade um, the, your say a proposal for component three is to reduce the number of performances <coughs> excuse me from three to two and to restrict these to individual rather than group sport performances um, it says accept video evidence for moderation. I have, I, have, I have a situation that's been aware to me that, that makes this issue real in that um, I'm aware of a, a talented PE student athlete um, who I understand currently participates in, in netball in Northern Ireland who has been advised that they cannot be assessed in um, in that group sport, despite risk assessments and other public health guidance allowing that sport to take place, but rather must be assessed in an individual sport, such as golf, swimming, orienteering, for example. Um, that, that student does not have prior experience of those individual sports. C can you um, speak to that particular proposal and how a student talented, capable in group sport is, is going to be able to receive the grade that they are capable of achieving in a group sport in an individual setting? Um, in, in the original proposal, when we developed it in pre-consultation through the subject advisory group, um, there were concerns because of where we were in terms of um, health arrangements at that time about taking forward group-based sports, um, particularly large team activities, and those were raised by practitioners with inside the subject advisory group. Obviously, that was at a point in time, and maybe this does demonstrate the challenges that SEER faces in terms of anticipating um, changes in the health restrictions over time and then trying to give certainty over that long period of time. Um, since then, and since then, we, we then proposed in the consultation that uh, group sport should be limited with the unit choice of admission. We weren't saying that it would be definitely d discounted, but it would be an admission choice in the assessment burden. Um, obviously recognising that since um, that original work with the subject advisory group there are changes in terms of active team sports that have been going on and those have been uh, made more available and so we put the proposal out as we originally constituted but we have received feedback now that it could be, could be allowed so we'll take that back on board in terms of our proposal. However, I would point out, Chair, that we are in a fluid situation um, on, on health grounds and I know that you know, different team sports are looking um, in terms of arrangements uh, at the moment. And so we'll, we'll have to keep it, all, and we have said this in our proposals, we just have to keep these situations under review. We don't want a disadvantage. Yeah. An individual child is able to demonstrate through team sport. And actually one of the contingencies that could be in that place is being able to de demonstrate individual skills. But we are, again, in these unique circumstances where you're trying to balance um, changing health situations versus assessment outcomes. It, it, not to be too prescriptive, but could, could the proposal, for example, be that um, permit 
um, group performances if current health guidance permits? Um, and or is there a need to make clear that the individual performances can be um, skills from group sport performed individually? Because there seems to be some confusion that that means individual sports rather than a group sports set of skills performed individually. Does that make sense? Yeah. I think, I think that we have to take it on board that we've taken the feedback and take that into the advice. I think we have to balance too much change over time with trying to provide particularly young learners at GCSE with continuity. Um, I, I think that uh, this committee has, has heard um, as I listen to the, the teaching unions about trying to get clarity and continuity as much as we can. So I, I want to limit changes over time as much as we can. Okay. Uh, but certainly we'll take the feedback and consider that in our... I mean, in a, in a nutshell, you can appreciate a, a talented PE student athlete and talented in the sport of netball, maybe completely unexperienced with the sport of swimming or golf, <laughs> and, and it would be at a significant disadvantage if that was the required assessment pathway yeah you know, I, I absolutely understand you concern. okay um it, you witnesses you've you've given us a, a significant amount of time today we we thank you for that i think we've gotten through um a good number of questions um we will obviously seek a copy of the written analysis of the consultation responses um from the minister it would seem is the best um point of request for that um, and it, it may be uh, necessary and helpful for you to return to the committee further to the provision of that advice to the minister, if possible. I think that um, in terms of the advice as the chairman outlined, we are on a time constraint. Um, we, we have to implement um, some of these solutions rapidly, not least because maths and English examinations take place in January. Sure. Um, we, we meet next week. So we have to be in a position. All right. Thanks very much. Thank you. Okay, members. Um, obviously, the committee uh, would wish to set out some degree of formal view in relation to the proposed changes in the CA consultation. Um, from my point of view, the, the key here is that we're looking for a fair and equitable system that um, grades individual ability. That, that was our, our key driver. Um, in 2020, and it will be our, our key driver in 2021. Um, can I propose that the committee uh, clerk moves into um, closed session uh, for a brief moment just to consider how best to um, submit that uh, formal view of the committee to the department? Members content? Content. Yeah, agreed. Okay, thank you. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee and Assembly Committee correspondence and such like. Okay, agenda item seven then, Clark. Uh, correspondence. You wish to speak to the correspondence? Thanks, Chairperson. Thirteen items this week. Um, summary notes at page two hundred two. So, if members are content to dispose of the correspondence in line with page two hundred two, following exceptions. So, at page two hundred five. Um, we have correspondence from the National Autistic Society seeking to brief the committee on its UK-wide report entitled Left Stranded, which outlines the experiences of autistic people and their families and carers during uh, COVID-19. Also, just after it, at page 219, is correspondence from the Evangelical Alliance, um, also referencing that report and talking about the um, impact of the uh, COVID-19 measures on individuals who live with an intellectual disability, including autism. So suggest, Chairperson, that if members are content to uh, seek to arrange a joint briefing with Autism NI and the Evangelical Alliance, um, and uh, we could put that into um, October, if that works, just to talk about that, because um, this plays into that uh, issue that members would be concerned about, about you know, vulnerable children, where were they when they weren't at school, how did the various support mechanisms which uh, the department and the education authority indicated they put in place actually work for them. Members are happy to do that. Agreed. 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 Thanks. Lovely. Okay. 7.4, correspondence from a concerned parent. Um, yeah, this was around... Um, they were making suggestions about schemes which SIA could adopt in order to provide a more suitable curricular offer for some children with SEN. And I think what they're actually talking about is maybe children with ADHD who might be higher functioning um, and they need a challenging curriculum. And they then perform like, really well. But um, the correspondence they sent includes a copy of an off-call commissioned report, which I think SIA played into, um, which includes 
information about at page 262 of your packs uh, on the growth in access arrangements and special consideration. Now, according to this report, 15% of French A-level students have access arrangements or special consideration in the UK. Don't know why French is much, much higher than other exams. It is a bit strange. Um, and there's also some concerns expressed in the report about the variation in access arrangements between better and poorer resource schools. So imagine a child with dyslexia. Um, one school might be able to give them a laptop and a scribe and I don't know what else. Another school, maybe not so much. Um, so that because that school is less well resourced. So therefore you have a difference in access for the child with the, the same um, uh, disability, if you like, or the same special educational need. Um, so the suggestion then, Chair, would be that, um, uh, sorry, that report actually calls an off call to undertake an assessment of the requirement and impact of access arrangements and, spe and special consideration. So are we content to forward the letter to SIA seeking its comments um, on that? I mean, are they undertaking um, this review of access arrangements and what are they doing about uh, you know, children with these particular special educational needs? Agreed. 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 Thanks, Chair. Um, then moving on to 7.6, which is at page 414, correspondence from Belfast Special Schools seeking a meeting with the committee. I suggest members that um, we invite the principals of these special schools to an informal meeting to discuss, to discuss their concerns and prior to a briefing on the 4th of November on special school area planning. So I contacted the Education Authority. They apparently have something to tell us on special school area planning and they would do it on the 4th of November. So if we heard from the special school principals, I know it's only Belfast, but um, that might give you a, a window into um, their views on special schools. That's agreed. Uh, yeah, I would, I would, I would love if schedule permitted for that to be a, a, a formal session rather than an informal session. Clark, um, is it really challenging schedule in which to make that possible? I think would you really? I think that members want to hear about the special school area planning. This is something that kicked off good grief five years ago. Um, this started and um, journal during the time that the executive was down. I was wondering what was happening and uh, we'd heard from our special schools at the start of the mandate, um, or the sort of the resumed mandate. Uh, so it's just, it, they're, they're finally ready to tell us something, apparently. 4th of November, I mean... Okay, well perhaps, we? <laughs> um, perhaps we can meet informally with a view to a formal meeting um, when the schedule permits. Jolly good. Okay. And then... Um, Members agreed with that? Yep. Yeah, agreed. okay. Thanks. Page 415, correspondence from a concerned parent about the inclusion of AS results in the calculation of A-level grades. Um, again, something that the committee's just been talking about. I think the committee has asked for this before, but I don't know if we've asked for it explicitly. This correspondent refers to the minister's statement of 16th of April, where he indicated that he had a detailed paper from SIA that set out a series of options for each of the qualifications that were under consideration. Um, so um, I suggest that the committee writes to the DE seeking sight of that uh, detailed report, which the SIA is said to have provided to the minister. Agreed? Agreed. Agreed. Lovely. And then. Uh, page 452, this is from Heat Boss. This is about single-use plastics in schools. So by way of a sort of a COVID um, measure, uh, one of the things that schools are doing is they're encouraging children to have their plastic lunchbox and plastic cutlery and they throw it away. So, there are, uh, so the suggestion is that we write to the Education Authority just seeking its views on the use of environmentally friendly plastics. So supposedly all these masks are creating a, a mountain of plastic which is ending up in the sea. So we could just ask what the EA thinks about that, if members are agreeable. Yeah, what page was that again? Sorry, sorry that's at page 452. Four, and that was all I wanted to draw members' attention to, if they were happy. And, and who are we forwarding that correspondence? To the Education Authority. Okay, can we send that to the department as well? Okay. Um. Marvellous. So if members are content mm -hmm. with the correspondence, went through that pretty quickly, but it wasn't as many as last week, thank goodness. Okay. Members content? Yep. Great, okay. Uh, agenda item 8, forward work programme. Can I refer members to your meeting packs included at page 461, our revised draft forward work programme, and ask the clerk to speak to this item? Sorry, members, me again. Um, the committee agreed a few briefings for the next few weeks last week. Some of the scheduling had to alter a bit. The minister can only do 7th of October, so he's planning on coming then with the Education Authority to talk about restart issues in schools, childcare, and the EA says they'll also talk about youth 
And I noticed there was some, there's something in the questions this week. Was it the member or was it Miss Mullen? Can't remember, but um, I noticed you've asked questions and got answers. So um, EA is also lined up to talk about youth that week, 7th of October, if that's okay. Additionally then, um, uh, DE and EA had agreed to come on the 23rd next week to talk about post-primary transfer. Um, and I, 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 the way I'd written it in the um, forward work programme, we thought we would have the feedback from our online survey enclosed, mm -hmm. just that you could deliberate among yourselves and then maybe have a wee think about, um, you know, members might want to have a, a committee motion mm -hmm. on the findings of that or not, depending yeah. on uh, how interesting you find that, in which case everything would be published anyway. So I don't know if you're content to um, uh, adopt that approach, do it enclosed and then um, publish later if you wish to. Mm -hmm. Uh, members content that seems a reasonable approach to me yeah and then also um suggesting that on the 14th of october we'll take a briefing uh from um it's actually going to be i think it's autism ni and uh the evangelical alliance but in addition once i'd sent this out the department then contacted me and said that they could come on the 14th of october to also talk about the new children and young people strategy so i, I know we knew about it and it was going to be adopted as an executive strategy, but I understand it has been revamped, so there are changes, so we could hear about them then on the 14th of October, if members are agreeable. Agreed. Agreed. And then, as is indicated, 4th of November, which is down the page, we'll have um, special schools area planning, and then um, sort of over that page, I just uh, suggested that, um, I know members were interested in the physical activity bit and how that impacts on um, well-being on the sports curriculum program all that good stuff so thinking of that for the 11th of november members are agreeable just to point out that's remembrance day i imagine there'll be something will happen in the assembly maybe outside don't know um but it would all it means is that we would stop at um you know appropriate time yeah quarter to 11 <laughs> come back about an hour later so maybe we might start a little earlier that day okay. uh, just to get all that done if that's happy and then um our planning session will dictate further schedules thereafter, yeah. Indeed. Are you yeah. interested in an integrated education brief? Yeah, well, that, we had a, a session scheduled with um, cool. the authors of the integrated education review, so yeah, it would be good to yep. get that back into the draft forward work programme, Clark. So that would be 18th of November, members, to get Colin Kavanagh and, uh, is it Professor Topping, um, if possible, back to talk about integrated education and then maybe get the department, the department. to answer. Mm -hmm. What have you done about that report that uh, I think Minister Weir commissioned? Or not, no, was it Minister who died? I think it might have been Minister who died. So members, are you content enough then with the forward work programme? Is there anything I've missed? Here we go, Karen. I don't think so. Karen? I know I was saying that the, the youth work wasn't a major priority, but I don't want them to slip off the work plan altogether. Um, I think it would be important to get the youth work alliance at some stage because youth services haven't reached well, they're very limited, but the duty restart back in October. Yeah. Um, so, as I say, if we can fit them in somewhere, yeah. it's not a priority. I don't want them to disappear. Absolutely. Okay, Mr. Chair. Okay, members content with the forward work programme? Uh, any other business? No, nope. not to know. Okay, then date, time, and place of next meeting is Wednesday, the 23rd of September, in room 29 by Starleaf at 9.30 a.m. Committee meeting does now adjourn. Right, thanks, Thank man. You. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29.